In a world where nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world, three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we revisit the films, shows, and games from our childhood to try to take another look at what we fell in love with. I'm your host, Nick, and sadly tonight, Dean was unable to join us while he's off in Hollywood land filming for a recent job. So from Screen Refresh, we have Tim, and joining in Dean's absence, David from Screaming Brain. Hey there. Halt, lizard man. You cannot escape. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's so good. (laughs) When I was watching it, I heard that line, and it was like, oh, I'm going to save that one. (laughs) <laughs> Today we'll be covering Ted and Mark Wahlberg's favorite movie, Flash Gordon. See, I never saw Ted, so I don't actually get that reference. I'm kind of sad about it. It's, I mean, you can catch the whole clip on YouTube. That's really all that kind of matters. Oh, I mean, I know this is a movie that's been like covered in pop culture stuff a whole bunch. Like, I even know that they've made Family Guy references on occasion to Flash Gordon, where they've actually brought in the original actors to actually record their famous oh, I, lines i thought you meant ted <laughs> Which oh, no. actually that makes the sense because seth mcfarlane doing family guy and doing ted and then in both of them doing heavy flash gordon stuff maybe he's just a really big flash gordon fan possibly i don't think it's for our generation and i definitely think it's for the generation before oh totally because i yeah and um he definitely rides that line so i'm not surprised and especially with how big of a star wars fan he is it makes sense that he's a big flash gordon person i mean we were we were probably a year and a half away from george lucas's flash gordon if things timed out a little differently yeah which is interesting on how this was originally supposed to be like he wanted to do flash gordon couldn't get it did star wars and then watching flash gordon i'm like there's so many similarities to Star Wars, but not necessarily like, oh, the storyline, but specifically how they do things. It just felt very Star Wars. Oh, yeah. I mean, George Lucas and Star Wars, while I love Star Wars, it's not the most original thing no. that's that's ever been made. So like the influences are, are super clear. Uh, and I just do love that there's the little anecdote that like George Lucas went and sought the license for Flash Gordon, but it was already like picked up and like getting ready for production. So he was like, oh, OK, I guess I'll just make a new hope instead. You mean this wasn't made because Star Wars blew up at the box office? No. So the the license was was um, was purchased for this movie to be made before A New Hope came out or before Mo- New Hope was even in production. Because this movie came out, what, like 81? Uh, 80. Uh, 80. Yeah. Still, they were like basically five years late to the production because figured Star Wars started in what, like 75? Yeah, I mean, this one was this was this one was planned for a while, but oh was production didn't start for a while after the um, the studio was really interested in getting it made. Um, so the license was kind of purchased and held for quite a while. And during the period while it was being held, George Lucas tried to get the rights to the license, but wasn't able to. That makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense, because a lot of points through this movie, I'm just thinking in a post Star Wars world, why did they go in certain directions in terms of the special effects? And some of it, I feel it was intentional because of its origin and they wanted to keep it campy. And I, you know, point blank, I didn't like the movie. I thought it was bad, but (laughs) because because of just what it was the level of camp the how they they always towed the line but they always knew when not to cross it like i didn't want to turn it off like i enjoyed myself through that entire two hours and you know that one hour and 57 minutes i think it was Uh, yeah Uh, like just over 150 yeah yeah like i enjoyed myself but it i just didn't understand on why they approach certain things the way they did with just like knowing you know every movie company is trying to make star wars again and you're literally holding the predecessor in your hands and you're not doing anything with it but uh. well i think there's certainly things in it that feel kind of influenced from it but i think it's this weird daisy chain of the original flash gordon comic strip and serials and things influencing the creation of star wars than the film Star Wars influencing in parts the film version of Flash Gordon 
without necessarily like it it doesn't feel like a star wars ripoff it just definitely feels like yeah there's the same dna out there in this yeah there's there's some similarities but you know the fact that they did depart from like what star wars was doing i i found in some ways refreshing now this movie predates me so i did not like go to the theater to see this i was not born (laughs) when it came out i stumbled upon this on like uh like an amc or tmc kind of channel just one day like because it was on kind of the same way that i i watched like most 80s fantasy or sci-fi movies in that genre like thinking about like legend or willow crawl yeah crawl you know the the he-man movie like those those were before (laughs) me but like i found those on tv randomly and this was one of those so like i didn't have that like initial uh feeling of it where it's like oh star wars just came out and what's this this looks terrible this you know i saw it when i was like 13 or something so the movie had been out for like what 15 years already (laughs) yeah that like three o'clock saturday afternoon on channel 11 kind of thing yeah so when i see it i'm like whoa this is so weird and like just quintessential 80s rock and roll sci-fi which is like not really a thing outside of kind of like the handful of movies i just mentioned like it it was almost its own genre like the amount of like um like hard rock sci-fi weirdness that was going on was like just just really captured me in the way that they 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 portrayed this whole this whole world well the thing that i really dug because i haven't mentioned it on air but this is the first time I've ever seen this movie. Wow. Oh, you too? Somehow it had eluded me for years. Like I had seen He-Man, I had seen Beastmaster, Conan, like all the various, like Crawl, as we mentioned, like all those like fantasy and sci-fi fantasy films. And I had never seen this. I loved it. And I feel like it ended up, it was of a time and it towed the line of being earnest in its campiness and it's kind of that like fun action sci-fi goofiness without ever delving into becoming a parody of what it's trying to do it's like it is a a fun love letter to flash gordon whereas i feel like nowadays there would have to be like a wink and a nod in all of the jokes of yes we're kind of making fun of this rather than we're coming from a place of love for the originals yeah you know, the, and i said i and i did say i didn't like the movie but tim you you nailed my exact appreciation for it and that's exactly, you know, the redeeming quality of it for me. Because as much as I didn't like it, that entire time, there wasn't a single point I wanted to turn it off. Like, uh, you know, this is definitely like laughable at a lot of points through the movie. But like, I, I was hooked through the entire thing. There wasn't a single point where I'm looking at my watch. Yeah, I feel like the movie was just serious enough for me to care about it. But also silly enough for me to be like, every, like moment to moment being like, what is going on right now? and yeah. like that combination was just like i am enthralled <laughs> well it's yeah. this odd thing of like there's like ming is threatening ming is cruel but then there'll be parts of like somebody's getting tortured and they're like but ming and he's just like standing in the background eating peanuts and he's just like continue <laughs> and then he leaves and it's like it's such a weird <laughs> juxtaposition but it ends up being funny without being like too comedic that it ruins mm-hmm. some of the tension um, yeah I, w- I wonder if that's the tone of the comics as well because like you know i i'm i never read the comics i mean that you know i say this movie predates me the comics predate me even further i mean flash gordon was first released in 1934 like and they re- they started writing it as a competitor to buck rogers because that was so popular yeah and i mean flash gordon ran from 1934 to 1993 um by king comics and was eventually purchased uh by dark horse where they did like a big uh omnibus reprint of it um which is supposed to be amazing but i doubt you can get it because that was in 93 um but so like i never read the comics but i I almost wonder like is is that the tone is that like silly but kind of serious i don't know i know like reading some of the background on it there was talk of the The script being like Dino De Laurentiis, the producer on this, asking the script writer um, to kind of punch up and make it a bit more humorous, which I guess bothered Mm. some people because the original strip itself wasn't necessarily this level of humor. It was more of a kind of a a hard boiled sci fi kind of thing with some like kind of fun fantasy things. But this seems to have taken it in a direction that I 
kind of like what they did with this. Although I guess if you're a fan of the original strips or the original serials, you would say, oh, this is a deviation from what I love. Yeah. And I mean, I think there were some nods to some serious parts, like serious things within it. Um, You know, this movie is like a very like pop like movie. It's it's kind of fun, silly, actiony. Yeah. Um, but like there's occasional nods to like really serious like undertones. And like when we start talking through the movie, like I wanna like just pay like quick attention to a couple of those little bites. But like it makes sense that it's kind of silly and campy. So the movie's written by Lorenzo Semple Jr. Uh and was brought on because he's a huge fan of the original comics. And uh Lorenzo uh at least when I was looking through his background, most notable, like wrote the Adam West Batman or was a writer on the Adam West Batman show. Yeah. Uh, he, he was also a writer on the old Green Hornet show. So he has this like very campy comic book uh, history to him. So that explains a lot. Yeah. Bringing some of that to Flash Gordon, you can totally see like how he kind of sampled some of like what he was doing with the Adam West Batman series uh, and, and brought that into this. Yeah, which I think he, considering doing the work on like Batman and doing the work on Green Hornet, he does that kind of fun campiness in this without ever getting into kind of the the deep Batman, like the Batusi and the mm. uh, shark repellent, like that level of stuff. It's like, it's it's cheeky without necessarily getting into goofy territory them here yeah there was there was no rails on adam west batman <laughs> <laughs> for better or worse yeah that sh- that show just did whatever it wanted um i thought it was funny because originally i think in the, the original adam west series he was an unaccredited writer and then uh i believe when the show came back uh at a point i think it had taken a break and it came back he was finally he finally actually got credits on the show so <laughs> Um, but yeah, but speaking of some of the people who worked on this, so, you know, this was directed by Mike Hodges, written by Lorenzo Semple Jr. Um, we have, you know, our, our, our main character, Flash Gordon, played by Sam Jones. Uh, Dale Anderson, the love interest in the movie, is played by Melanie Anderson. Uh, we have Dr. Hans Zarkov, played by, I, he, I guess he has a share kind of thing going on, because he's, he's known only as Topol. Topol. Um, it's great. <laughs> which I just love. So I was watching this with um, my fiance and we were watching and then Zarkov comes on the screen and it's during the brainwash scene and whatnot. And she's, this guy really has Tevya energy. And then we Google it and come to find out he is Tevya from Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. Um, so it's makes a lot more sense now. But I loved Zarkov in this movie. Oh, just fantastic. Um. So then we have, uh, I'm going to butcher her name, uh, Ornella Mewitt as Princess Aura. Um, we have Prince Baron, played by the dashing, dashing scene-stealing Timothy Dalton. Timothy of, Dalton uh, doing his best Errol Flynn as he walks. Uh, it feels like he would walk directly from the set of this into the Rocketeer. Yeah. I mean, his costume is spot on for like um, for, for him uh, playing Errol Flynn. Like, I don't know. He he could go from this directly to playing a Robin Hood even. Oh yeah. It was it was a very very similar costume, almost a very similar character. But when when he first comes on to on the screen, just totally diverts all of my attention of just like, wait a second. Is that Timothy Dalton? So he's so <laughs> dashing. Well, it's weird cuz you see all of these like the lizard people and the hawk men and like Ming <laughs> and his like people and all of a sudden Timothy Dalton walks in and you're like, that guy's a 10 in a room full of fours. <laughs> And he just like is it, he comes into like the the the, the palace uh, kind of main chamber just like just strutting <laughs> like with all of the energy that he can muster coming down those steps just steals the whole thing. Um, then we have kind of uh, Timothy Dalton or Prince Baron, uh, his counterpart uh, Prince Voltan uh, of the the Hawk people, uh, Brian Blessed. Um, who, you know, we've seen a few things. He was Star Wars Episode One, The Phantom Menace as Boss Nass. Uh, he was in Tarzan the Animated Movie. He's done a bunch of a bunch of voice work, uh, including two of my favorite credits, I think. And I'm I'm half joking about this, but half serious. Uh, where he does the voice of Gortek uh Gernison in Total War Warhammer 2. 
Uh, and he also plays as Constantine, a uh, Imperial Guard commander and Tau Fire Warrior, which to have oh, one right your alley. to have one Warhammer acting credit, I'm like, Chef's kiss. Two? <laughs> we are best friends. Especially since he has a whole behind the scenes like video series of him doing the voice of Gortek from Total War Warhammer. And he does a great job. It's perfect. That that character is a very, very angry dwarf who just wants to die in battle and he kills it. It's great. <laughs> I've never heard of Brian Blessed until like I used to just when I would drive on long trips at night, I would just put like Spotify on random and it would just like pull things through. And then it randomly had some like night playlist that played, I think it was called like the White City Part 2. And it was just like a spoken word story narrated by Brian Bless that I have no idea where it came from about these like children in a po or post-apocalypse setting just trying to like vie for leadership among the group and like taking on rival gangs. And I have no idea what it's from because I could never find a part one or the rest of the story that I don't know if it's just this random 13 minute non sequitur that doesn't exist anywhere else. So when I saw this, I was like, oh, I know that voice. Yeah, I mean, he he's done a ton of voice work, way more voice work than like real, like true acting credits. Um, I think his his career took a turn and he just like really doubled down on his voice work. And in the movie, like it, he has a really commanding voice in it. Like he he, he really he, makes that character something special. He I felt put 200 percent in and as much as Timothy Dalton stole the scene. I felt Brian Blessed stole it away from him. Hmm. And at first, like, I didn't realize who he was. The more I heard his voice, I'm like, it sounds kind of familiar. I looked it up. And when I saw that he played Boss Nass, it clicked. And then after that point on, it just felt like he just embodied Leonidas from 300 the entire <laughs> time he's on screen. He's always got this big ass smile on his face. He's ready to just throw himself in the middle of combat. And it's just like, I'm cackling with laughter at the end of the movie when he's like, dive in the way that he's saying it. <laughs> hysterics I mean, I, every single time but like captivated every single minute he's on screen i mean i will just occasionally just shout out like dive hawkman dive <laughs> just for no reason just because i love that line so much i mean uh, yeah. personally i was more interested in the the prince baron prince voltan relationship than most of the rest of the movie like i mm -hmm. that's the movie i want to see i want to see the buddy cop prince baron prince voltan just going on like cracking skulls and the, the the cosmos i mean it turns into this like legolas gimli kind of thing oh um, yes, between yes. the two of them this like rivalry but they're kind of friends because they're working on the same side by the end of this also yeah. it just feels like voltan would at some point be played by john reese davies if this were like the late 90s <laughs> and if they ever i mean if they ever do that remake who knows i mean i know uh studios are working with uh Takua Titi to make a new Flash Gordon uh which is oh. actually recent news and I think to myself like yeah that that makes sense because Takua Titi could really use something to to fuel his fantasy goofiness and I feel like this could do it yeah because I feel like maybe not like Love and Thunder Taika Waititi but Ragnarok Taika Waititi like would be yeah. more in line with doing something along these lines maybe not like the classic comic strip serials but like taking a book uh, a page out of this book yeah not to digress too much but have you seen like so the problem with modern star wars now is they keep announcing projects and they keep canceling them almost in the same breath like hey we're making this oh wait never mind oh we're doing this we even shot a promotional thing oh wait never mind so have you seen the star wars project that taika was supposed to make no, I didn't actually. I, I had heard about it, but I hadn't seen anything outside of like... Yeah, the only thing that they did was they made a promotional poster for it. And imagine the Star Wars logo, but in the same exact way that um, Schoolhouse Rock is shown. Like that poster, but imagine it just saying Star Wars instead. Oh, okay. So I can only imagine like his kind of weird quirky added to any kind of movie but nothing else was said and i'm actually hoping more that he does flash gordon versus him doing star wars yeah it's hard to say with taka he you know he has his own style for for good or worse um and sometimes it hits sometimes it doesn't um but uh, like at the end of the day like he's really 
desired right now as a director because like when he hits like he hits yeah. um and you know i'm curious about what he would do with a flash gordon i mean i don't know if it'll ever get made it was originally announced as a animated feature that was then re- recently switched to going to be a live action project so that doesn't give me like a ton of faith that this will actually get made but just the fact that they're thinking about it and like they have put bids on the license is like oh that's cool something might happen um because i think there's just there's so much to tread with flash gordon that hasn't been done that could be fun and interesting and like a really color colorful sci-fi adventure um that we haven't really seen yeah when i was watching it i almost felt like you know this movie i think would have taken huge leaps forward if you kept everything a hundred percent the same but instead of live action do it in the same animated style as heavy metal i mean i could see that absolutely yeah. i mean i I wonder if they worried about the potential box office appeal of that. And they were kind of hoping that like, oh, we could get like a big like franchise uh, kind of movie series. Mm. Now, when af- even after the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, this will never be a franchise. Like this is a very niche movie that is not for everyone. And I mean, we, we saw that in like the box office numbers. Like the movie only grossed 27 million and it was only in theaters for about four weeks. Um, before it started to get pull, it had a very, very limited shelf life. Now, when it was released, it didn't go up against much. I mean, okay, in terms of big box office movies, it didn't go up against much, but like it went up against Raging Bull. So like kind of went up against something, but not really because Raging Bull didn't do great in theaters either. Um, but, you know, now we all know, you know, many, many years later that Raging Bull is a, you know, a a, a movie that's worth studying in most cinema classes. Cause- was Raging Bull directly before this or kind of the, the lead in weekend? Uh, so or was it, Flash oh, Gordon was afterwards. Dece- was uh, Flash Gordon came out on December 5th, 1980. Um, I thought it was the same weekend. Yeah, because it had been, I guess, pre released um, November 14th, Raging Bull, but it was oh, like in select theaters in New York, but then it got wide release December 19th. So it came in and kind of ate this one's lunch i'm assuming Mm. then directly after yeah i know around that time there was also a um what was it um uh spacing on the name of the movie so it doesn't matter because i think either the a couple days after the weekend after was when we got like popeye um yeah nine to five later that month was altered states it was more so sitting against a lot of more family friendly or more adult comedies from mm-hmm. there so i it really is kind of its own it carved out its own thing so i don't see it getting a lot of competition but unfortunately it just seems like people were i'm gonna spend money on one movie and it's not gonna be this yeah it just it just didn't it couldn't hold up for itself unfortunately it wasn't like something came in that was like similar or like people had to decide i think they just saw the trailer and were like i don't know about this this seems weird star wars did a re-release that weekend <laughs> <laughs> no because even growing up i don't honestly remember seeing this movie at all i don't remember seeing it on television um and the only exposure that i have to it i think is from pop culture references from other things mm-hmm. but in actual seeing the movie itself like i don't know man like i obviously with ted family guy i know those were a lot of big influences but and even watching a lot of behind the scenes stuff with star wars every time it mentions flash gordon this movie's never mentioned it's only specifically like the serials like the black and white show that was created the comic books the radio plays that was the only thing mentioned Hmm, but i never thought of actually like looking into the movie itself or at least this one anyway yeah and honestly like the movie died so quick in theaters like it it's almost surprising that it does get referenced in pop culture as much as it does it's that soundtrack man oh man it's a great soundtrack it is a great i mean soundtrack. If, i mean that's when i how kind of how i sold it to you guys i was like oh man flash gordon goofy high like high fantasy sci-fi film even if you hate it just stay for the soundtrack um the soundtrack is composed and uh, performed entirely by queen which just lends just 
this beautiful 80s synth rock uh kind of background to the whole thing and it's it's really delightful i mean and for queen this was this was queen's first soundtrack album that they had done uh it actually reached number 10 on the uk album charts i think in the u.s it was <laughs> in the, so yeah it was in the mid 20s in the u.s so not quite as big of a hit but like still like it, it had an impact and it is a great great soundtrack and the title track is just awesome and is something i just put on all the time and subject people to it who always look at me kind of confused but it's it's a it's a mood it's crazy how the title track from this just could end up on just a playlist with other mm -hmm. non-soundtrack songs i can't really think of a ton of soundtrack songs like that are part of the soundtrack and not like oh it's a needle drop during the movie it's like no specifically from this that would end up fitting in elsewhere. This just sounds like a Queen song. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean that's what I love about the soundtrack. Like the the soundtrack only has two tracks on it with lyrics. Um I know the the title track Flash Gordon. I can't remember the other one. Um Flash Gordon but... Reprise. <laughs> Flash, Gordon, <laughs> Flash Gordon remixed. Um but yeah, it's just I mean if you like synth rock, like this is just an album to listen to. Yeah, I know you kind of immersed us in it by just, okay, we're just, we're all together. We're going to play some board games or something. We're going to have dinner. Let's just turn on the Flash Gordon soundtrack and let that thing run top to bottom. <laughs> it sets a mood. Well, it it really works. I don't, I don't want to skip ahead, but like at the end of the movie when he's riding on like the, the treadmill scooter. And <laughs> I mean, um, that's an accurate description. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> like i'm screaming at the tv like if they don't play the theme song right now i'm turning this movie off because that was the ultimate best placement for the theme song to play during the movie that when they finally did it i'm like yes that is exactly the moment i needed well not it only is, do you, it, you get it but then you get like the the classic queen brian may guitars of just the yes like the high notes there loved it and you get like when the song when the song comes in, it has this great, uh, like bass riff lead in that's just this like boom, 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 like real low. And it's quiet, and it, it like yeah, it's it really like, real like draws you in. Yeah, and you're just like, oh, I'm like, I'm excited. Like, what's gonna happen? And then it just like explodes, and it's just like, oh, this is beautiful. Oh, such a great soundtrack. We do have one more cast, uh, cast member I wanted to mention. How we couldn't finish a cast list without talking about uh, Emperor Ming, our main antagonist. Uh, played by Max von Sydow, uh, famously uh, from The Exorcist, uh, recently from the, uh, the film Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. And um, for those who watched it, uh, Game of Thrones, uh, The Three-Eyed Raven. Uh, he was, we he think... was in Star Wars, too. He was, um, he was in the beginning of The Force Awakens. Oh, I, I try to pretend that movie doesn't exist. It's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like... <laughs> For also, I don't know if you've ever seen the film The Seventh Seal, um, the Ingmar or the Ingmar Bergman film. Um, the oh, whole no. thing of like the the knight playing chess against death. That's him. He's the knight. Oh, okay. What you always think of being this like old, old, old film, and it's like, how is he that old there? And how is he still like alive in all of these movies that are still coming out now? Yeah, I mean, he's had a, a very, a very long career. Yeah, because, I mean, uh, Seven Seal was 57. Career. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't he up there with, like, Christopher Lee with the different things that he's done? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and he just does a great job as Emperor Ming, who is both evil, intimidating, and also slightly weird and kind of kind of a goof. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Emperor Ming's like a, a weird villain. It's like a fun dictator yeah <laughs> oh god so so that's that's kind of our, our our main cast um one kind of fun thing about it so sam jones who plays uh flash um ended up dropping out of the film uh immediately when they finished the first the first uh shoots so he actually left and never came back for any reshoots um <laughs> he claimed that a, a more recent interview um that it was because he just he didn't know like he thought he was done and then he was just like oh my agent will just handle like the end of the movie stuff for me and like whatever legal stuff <laughs> what as a stand-in <laughs> no, he was just like oh i like i finished the movie i'm done 
And he was just like, I was like a stupid kid in my 20s. Like, what did I know about how movies are made? Um, so he was just like, oh, the movie's <laughs> finished. First step, you stay in front of the camera until they say you're done. <laughs> he was like, oh, we wrapped. I didn't know there was reshoots. We're done. Um, Wait, they take more than one day? <laughs> <laughs> but like, before the interview came out, it was said that he had a lot of disagreements with the film's writer and the director, and he dropped out be because of, of that. Um, which ended up leading the the production crew having to dub over a lot of his films, a lot of his shots um, because of the reshoots, uh, which honestly is flawless. Um, yeah. I don't think there was ever a moment where I was like, oh, that voice sounds weird or something doesn't sync. Like it was like perfect. Yeah, because at no point, even knowing that at no point was like, oh, oh OK, no, like I, I see it like he just seems like yeah that's his voice that's this yeah i mean I, i'm not gonna say that i wouldn't have maybe preferred uh the director's original choice of kurt russell who you know turned it down for you know because he's kurt russell uh in the 80s so <laughs> well so i like how he had said like i guess he turned it down because it was um not what he was looking for it was a little too not disney enough well like light goofy <laughs> fun and he did escape from new york instead but then he goes and does big trouble little china where it's kind of in that same vein of like a fun goofy kind of wacky action fantasy yeah i would say like big trouble little china is an eight and this is a nine like that is a very easy step he could have made into that maybe yeah. he just didn't want to do like the sci-fi stuff did he do yeah i guess he really didn't do much well, I mean, yeah, he's well, he done did, science he did, fiction, he did but he had eight. not not in the same level as like that kind of science fiction dealing with yeah. like aliens and you know like different races on screen, not just dealing with like a single alien thing or you know just like I I guess you can say Escape from L.A. and New York would be considered like science fiction, but I mean not in the same. Yeah, it's like dystopian like, sci-fi. Yeah. yeah, it's not like hard sci-fi with like rocket ships and speeder bikes and, and hawkman and hawkman the forest moons can't, of endor can't deny the hawkman they're which the best part of the movie i'm glad this did work out this way because i think if he had decided to do this not only would we have not gotten escape from new york probably but the reaction to this probably would have soured him to accepting the role of jack burton later on if it was like mm, I did this kind of fantasy thing and it did not go well for my career. Or, you know, Flash Gordon might have turned into the mega franchise that they had planned on. Um, Ooh. Because when, so, they, when they originally signed the cast, the cast was signed for multiple films. Is that contract uh, still in place? <laughs> and it was only after... Um, it, was, uh, it was only after Sam Jones dropped out because he didn't understand how movies worked. Uh, and... <laughs> <laughs> please please i'm sorry sam um only after he dropped out and you know the movie didn't do great that they're like oh no this isn't gonna happen but they had originally signed the cast on for a franchise i would have been really excited to see like a full trilogy of flash gordon tim when did the thing come out before or after after never mind uh the thing was i think 82 or 83 because I was thinking the thing bombed and it didn't do well. Maybe it was because of that that he said no to this, but I guess not. If anything, he probably said yes to the thing, realizing how much he probably had FOMO for make not making Flash Gordon. <laughs> Damn it, I missed out on Flash Gordon. Give me the thing. Uh, I could have bombed hard. <laughs> well, did it again. <laughs> Despite its popularity, the thing did not do well. Yeah. Yeah, I actually didn't know the thing didn't do well. I wouldn't have thought that based on my own uh, reaction to the thing. Moral of the story, critics and audiences cannot tell you what to like. Just go enjoy it for you. But you should probably watch Flash Gordon because it's really good. Yeah, it is. Watch it. <laughs> I don't even like though. it, and I'm telling people, fucking watch it. It is worth mm. watching at least once in your life. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of watching the movie, uh, do you guys want to get into the the synopsis sure nope, we're all set so thank you for joining <laughs> tonight <laughs> we have we have told you enough go <laughs> do your own research <laughs> all right take it away david so flash gordon so the the movie opens and 
the first thing that you're going to realize as this movie opens is it immediately hits you with that beautiful title track. <laughs> and if you're not sold in the first three seconds, I don't, I, I can't help you. Um, but so it opens, we hear the Queen title Flash Gordon soundtrack uh, starts, and we hear the disembodied voice of Max von Sydow, who plays Emperor Ming. To amuse himself, he's going to torture the Earth with all sorts of natural disasters. And he has this this lovely little like light up console <laughs> that looks a lot like a light bright that has different natural disasters for him to choose from. And he has like uh, like fire, hail and tornadoes and like earthquakes. And they're all lighting up as he's kind of kind of like a, a kid in a candy store, just pushing all of these buttons to uh, to subjugate the earth. I had a I had a laugh because when I saw Typhoon and Hurricane, I'm like, isn't that isn't that the same thing? Just <laughs> different hemispheres. Is it actually? No, no, yeah. it is. Yeah. Well, he has both, just in case. <laughs> um, yeah, so he's he's torturing the Earth with all these natural disasters, and he eventually plans to destroy it from his, you know, eighty the eighties future computer console, which is always that weird place in sci-fi where things of the future in the past always just kind of look silly. I don't know. Oh, I forget the term for that. It's like that weird lo-fi. That's it, yeah. Because Alien had that, you know, this had that, and just pretty much every other movie from the 80s thinking, like, this is what the future is going to be like. And it's, you look at it now, and it's not even close. It's like, why does everything have so many lights? I don't understand. I mean, it's... So many buttons. Yeah, I mean, it looked like they were going to try to beam Scott Bakula home on the next leap. Uh, using this thing <laughs> the the device that never made any sense and was basically just like a flashlight or like a, <laughs> a, a light bulb with like like jolly ranchers taped to it <laughs> um i, I did so, like the comic so, strip montage though for it as they oh like the, in the in the intro yeah like when it kicks off with the the queen music and the talk and whatnot and getting the the comic strip montage of the classic stuff as they go oh in. yeah it's very reminiscent of, uh, well, I guess it's reverse reminiscent of what Marvel does yeah. with their movies. Except How, like, they, they give you time movies. to see the strips. Yeah. I think that was that, that was more of like an old school Marvel thing where they would show that. And now they have so many movies, they just show you clips of their movies that they've done. They have enough B-roll to actually do the real thing now. Well, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's because they do it for you because they know you have to watch 48 other films to understand what's going on in the one you're sitting in the theater for. <laughs> so it's like, here's 14 you seconds. You have seen Iron Man? Yeah. yeah here's uh, like Iron Man in the span of like two and a half seconds. I mean, it works. I mean, you know, I, I think I think the Marvel Cinematic Universe works in a way that doesn't make any sense, but does. I mean, I think it's the what's the term like too big to lose or something like this at this point. It's like it's a behemoth. It's gotten up to speed. If it hits any bump, it just blows through it and continues going. Yeah. At this point, it's it's the Marvel Cinematic Universe is bigger than any one movie. It's better. It's bigger than any four movies, honestly. <laughs> It's bigger than any 47 movies. <laughs> like they could have like five, six movies back to back that are just terrible. doesn't matter. Yeah. So yeah. So after seeing some of the, the, the disasters going on on earth firsthand through uh, Emperor Ming's little viewfinder, which has like a, a weird targeting reticle for some reason, because he has to target planets. I mean, figure that would be easier. <laughs> um, we're, we're kind of zoomed. We're zoomed into earth to meet our, our hero flash uh, played by Sam oh. Jones. <laughs> saber of the universe it's so good uh and flash is just he's just chilling um and this is the one thing i love i love about flash is that he's just some dude nothing nothing special he's like he's just chilling out he's he was finishing up his long vacation he's waiting for a private plane to show up to bring him home yeah is he and the quarterback for the new york jets yeah well, if you don't if you're not if you're not sure you can just check out the shirt because he's wearing his own merch <laughs> I, I mean, he's got to rep the brand. <laughs> yeah, and like the first few minutes of the film, he like doesn't say anything. He's totally silent, which I thought at first that like, oh, is this the dubbing thing? And I was like, no, he's just, he's just being a cool guy. <laughs> His lips don't move. You just tear him the entire <laughs> film like a noir. Was, this was a weird choice. <laughs> um, but yeah, Flash Flash gets on the plane. He boards his, his private jet, which I guess wasn't private because there's one other person on it. And that's um, the, the movie's future love interest, Dale Arden. Uh, and she's on there and she is a, um, a travel agent 
uh, who is deathly afraid of flying. Uh, and when Flash gets on the plane, we actually find out that he is the star quarterback of the New York Jets. Uh, one of the pilots has a magazine with him on the cover. And we learn in that little clever bit of exposition. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the best quarterback the New York Jets has ever had, fictional I mean, or otherwise. I would assume so. If you were going to call a quarterback for the Jets a star, then I would imagine it would have to be Flash Gordon. <laughs> well, don't forget, it's the 1980s New York Jets. But let's see Tom Brady take down a space dictator. <laughs> then come talk. Say it loud enough and you probably will be made into a movie. <laughs> say it three times and he appears like Beetlejuice. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go back and check because as the movie goes on, and as you mentioned, like Dale is the love interest. As the movie goes on and it's like, Flash, Dale, I have to get back to Dale. I have to get back to Flash. And it's like, oh, okay, yeah, they've definitely, they knew each other. And then I remembered, no, they met each other for the first time on this plane. Did they just yeah, become a couple instant, like, scenes. couples? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I know Flash mentions that, like, he saw her at a restaurant the night before. He, like, went to the, the host and was like, who is that woman? But, like, that was, that was it before the plane. Like, he was just like... <laughs> made eyes at her and then, and then the next day he's like oh man she's on the plane with me i gotta make my i gotta shoot my shot which i don't know how he's like surprised on a private plane he's like she's on my pl she got on my flight yeah it's your plane man <laughs> yeah the plane's got the plane's got four seats <laughs> he must not be good at flirting considering that the only way he was able to like start a conversation with her was to mansplain to her how flying works <laughs> Because that's when, like, the plane starts to go through turbulence and stuff, and she's reacting. He's like, well, you see, air moves over the wings. Like, yeah, we, we, we know, buddy. That's I the mean, whole point of uh, I wonder if they here. did that purposely just for the, like, Flash isn't just some dumb lunk. It's, <laughs> okay, there's a little bit to him. He knows how that's wind works. the way works. to show that he's not all brawn. <laughs> like, well, on. no, the, the, whole, the whole him explaining flying was the very clever, very clever and huge quotes set up of the fact that they very offhandedly mention that flash has been taking flying lessons true but not landing so, lessons but not landing lessons so when the plane <laughs> is being bombarded by fire hail which i hope isn't a real thing um <laughs> from 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 ming's uh terrible planet death weapon uh and breaks through the cockpit sucking out the two pilots we know because of this offhand comment a offhand comment that flash can fly the plane um he can't land it so well but he he's been taking lessons so he knows their only option is for him to maintain flight of the plane the duration of the movie because he doesn't know how to land which is 115 minutes of him just like denzel in flight just keeping this thing going it's just it's just the plane slowly eventually lands like after like flying for hundreds and hundreds of miles as it runs out of gas and just gets closer and closer to the ground. So the plane is hit by fire comets and the two pilots are sucked out of the plane and Flash has to take over. Uh, meanwhile, we meet our other, uh, our other protagonist in the film, Dr. Zarkov, uh, played by Topol. Love him. Uh, who's, who's in his sort of half greenhouse half laboratory <laughs> that's not, that it's a, weird it's a little a little unclear oh, i thought it was like disguised as a greenhouse oh maybe that was it it was never really mentioned like what was going on but like it was like a greenhouse lab and like there were plants like everywhere so like it kind of seemed like a functioning greenhouse but had like a very dr frankenstein like setup inside with like all of the giant computers with flashing lights and buttons. And it's here that Dr. Zarkov and his assistant um, Porkins. find out. Wait, what? His assistant, Porkins. <laughs> his assistant, who who honestly is a very, is a, like a really great actor and like does a great job with it, despite only being in the film for like two and a half minutes. Oh, yeah. It's William Hootkins. He actually was Porkins from A New Hope. Oh, I didn't realize that. I thought that you were just making a joke about it. Oh, him. no. No, you literally, yeah, he was Porkins. <laughs> I mean, he was also he's in more, Raiders. It, yeah, that he has a lot. Well, he's the one that says, you know, we have top men looking into it. Top men. Oh, okay. When Andy is, asks about the arc. So the, this guy just has tons of bit parts with great lines. So yeah, so Dr. Zar Zarkov and his assistant are in the greenhouse laboratory. Uh, and 
Dr. Zarkov is originally woken up by his assistant because it is 8.30 in the morning and there is no sun. <laughs> and I mean, I feel like that happens sometimes. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong with daylight savings time. I mean, maybe up in Vermont. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that could be. It's dark here a lot. And so Dr. Zarkov is incredibly alarmed because he believes uh, there is to, a the detriment of, <laughs> to, <laughs> to the detriment of his career that the natural disasters are an attack from outer space. I mean, we know he's right, but everyone believes he's wrong as a crazy person. Um, now, to be fair, Dr. Zarkov acts like a crazy person. Um, <laughs> in the beginning, he absolutely does. He like, Later on in the movie, he kind of balances out, and he seems like only the, the smart one of the entire group. But yeah. in this like 10-minute segment, he is batshit insane. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, he, you know, he, he has a pistol for some reason. We don't know why. He just <laughs> Science. Does. And, and, and he's... he's he, He's trying to convince his assistant to get on to his homemade rocket, uh, which I assume the greenhouse is supposed to be a cover for because he built his own rocket. I don't know how you can cover for that. And he's like, we have to go into outer space and launch a counterattack against the space forces, which <laughs> is the worst idea. I mean, first of all, he doesn't even know what they are. He doesn't know where they are. He doesn't know if the rocket's going to work. And and his assistant clearly is on the same page of us, where like Doctor Zarkov, you're insane, and now he has Doctor Zarkov waving a gun at him, threatening him, um, and luckily his assistant rightfully flees for his life. <laughs> like how he aims the gun at him, he's like, "You're coming with me, or I'm going to kill you." He's like, "Whether you kill me now or I go on that thing and I die later, it's the same result." <laughs> uh, so Doctor Zarkov's uh, assistant rightly leaves, and. You know, lo and behold, you know, the divine providence moments later, <laughs> Flash, uh, <laughs> Flash manages to sort of land the, land the plane. I mean, he safely crashes it directly into the lab, the, the lab of Dr. Zarkov. <laughs> Dr. Zarkov. Um, I love the pan perfectly. out shot and you see like the plane is just like of that massive field that that greenhouse is in. He decided to just ram it right into the building. I mean, he didn't know how to land. He just. He did. He did his best. It ran. It ran out of gas naturally, and that's where it fell. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that they like they they crash land. They go through this building, the greenhouse, all the glass, and then they just get out of the plane. Like they just it's nothing. Nothing happened. I mean, he's the star quarterback of the New York Jets. I mean, what are you gonna do? <laughs> so they get out of the plane and are greeted by Doctor Zarkov, who is just who had just scared his uh, his lab assistant away, and it still has the gun in his hand, which he very nonchalantly hides behind his back and tries to put on like a smiley like very normal person face um and ask them oh how basically like how are you as if they just came and like knocked on his door he's just like oh yeah what's going on you guys okay do you need a phone <laughs> like the equ the equivalent of like our car broke down outside to the to, to the your plane crashed into this building <laughs> it doesn't phase dr zarkov he's just rolling with the punches there uh so with the the offer of a telephone dr zarkov actually leads them towards the <laughs> rocket uh now immediately they start to suspect that something is going wrong uh more <laughs> dale than flash uh she seems to be uh, a little bit more cautious around dark dr zarkov leading dr zarkov to actually have to pull the gun out at them and and physically force them into the rocket because his rocket has the worst design where it it physically needs two people to run it because one person has to push one button and another person in the rocket has to keep their foot on a pedal that is in an opposite location. <laughs> and they, these two things are too far away from each other for one person to do at the same time. Oh, if only I designed this ship so that one person can pilot. I don't know. I mean, maybe he just had a lot of faith in his assistant or like they were BFFs. And he's like, I want to make sure I can't go on my own. <laughs> Cover me <portraits>. I, <laughs> It's like, we're going to do this together. It's going to be a real bonding experience for us. <laughs> um, so he forces them into the rocket. He originally only wants Dale. Uh, and tries to kick Flash out. But after they start fighting over the gun, um, Flash accidentally hits a button, which closes the door and simultaneously starts the rocket, which, I mean, <laughs> another great Dr. Zarkov design. Uh, that's called I mean, efficiency. 
<laughs> he's like when i'm launching this thing i'm launching this thing <laughs> so after the struggle the rocket launches and successfully sends all three out into deep space i didn't think i i figured it would blow up and then the movie would end right there and that was the end of flash gordon the entire film is just like the moments before his body gives out <laughs> sarkov's <laughs> dream it just becomes like apollo 13 the movie after that <laughs> You know, I appreciate, too, playing so much Kerbal Space Program that once the ship exits the atmosphere, it alters its direction and continues like the engines cut out. It alters direction and then it continues forward, because if it just continue to go up and then the, the rockets cut out, the rocket is just going to basically come right back down to Earth because it yeah, hasn't actually... entered orbit. It's just in space at this point. It's just not in orbit yet. So the fact that they did that, I'm like, you know what? You're smarter than you appear, movie. I appreciate that. Yeah, despite all of Dr. Zarkov's other questionable designs, like once the rocket enters, like out, like out or exits the atmosphere, it, it actually is a really well performing rocket where like, it goes through a whole like breaking apart sequence and changes directions and like is able to navigate to the uh, the wormhole that Emperor Ming had opened for his device to be able to attack the Earth. Meanwhile, all three of them are passed out from the g-force i guess i'm not really sure why they're passed out but they are <laughs> sure um so yeah so his rocket works really well and sends them to a wormhole out in deep space uh which takes them to the planet mongo uh which is basically emperor ming's i guess his main planet so like emperor ming is like the ruler of all all the universe or at least that's what they keep saying um, and I guess this is like specifically his planet where he has his palace on it. And so uh, Flash, Dale and Zarkov successfully land on the planet. Um, I don't think it's the smoothest landing, though we don't really see it. Uh, and they get out of the rocket and they're immediately met uh, by Ming's kind of. I don't know, almost like his secret police or his guards, which. I mean. This is this is the real introduction to the movie is this scene. Yes. When when the rocket crash lands on the planet and we see Ming's giant red and gold palace in the background and we're introduced to these guards who are also like crazy super shiny red and gold armor with the gold skull masks on uh and just the most 80s rock and roll thing ever. I mean all of his hench it's his henchmen all had different outfits because it's like Clytus had his outfit and then the red and gold guards, but then there's other guards in red. Like everybody looks like they're coming back from the Met Gala in space. 100%. Yeah, I really feel like at this point is when the movie really starts. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've gotten past like the intro and now it's like, oh, this. So this is what's going to happen. And also like. my this, this scene has so much to unpack. <laughs> I'm not going to unpack it all. But one thing I am going to unpack is so they they ca they capture Flashdale and Zarkov and they capture them using these non-lethal weapons. And this is the only time we see it. It's almost like the 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 stun blast in uh Star Wars a New Hope that we only ever see once. They they shoot them with a gun that fires a hand. Just like <laughs> a disembodied golden hand. Big beast crashing fist. That's like that's like attached to like an energy lasso to the gun. And so they shoot the fist <laughs> at Flash <laughs> and it like wraps its, it and the hand wraps itself around his neck and like body slams him. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just, I sit there and I watch this scene and I'm like, where are we going with this? You know, it's we, like see, I'm ex we see the hands later on, but it's, they use them as restraints when, um, the doctor's on the table. Oh, okay. And there's no energy stuff with it. It's just so he's basically laying there, but it looks like he's got like four gloves holding his arms and legs down. But the whole time I was really hoping that we would see like the energy beam coming off of it just to show like it that's what's holding him down. Or he tries to get up and, you know, the, the hand will just reach up and grab him and pull him back down again. Or at least that's what I was hoping for. It's like a weird cross between something from Dr. Seuss and Joker's giant like boxing glove um gun from batman the animated series yes. i was really yeah, hoping like they would version. fire it and instead of like grabbing him and doing something else it would literally just be a fist that just punches him <laughs> just in the face <laughs> but then it doesn't just, return I... it just punches him and then just drops to the ground and he has to wheel it back with a crank <laughs> into his gun 
I just loved that gun so much. It was like, I'm just going to shoot this hand at you and it's going to do what it wants. I, I think. I don't think you can tell the hand what to do. Somebody mod that into Blade and Sorcery. <laughs> I mean, it's a good idea. <laughs> just ranged hand attack. I don't know. He's outside of melee range. I'd buy another <laughs> VR thing just to do that one gun. <laughs> It's like it's like mage hand in D&D except there's no limit to the weight it can carry. <laughs> um so Flash Dale and Zarkarf are captured using the hand gun. Uh and they're brought to the palace <laughs> before okay. Ming, which it's a hand gun. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's so good. <laughs> I wonder I wonder if that was like the joke in the comic is that it was a hand gun. <laughs> I mean, if not, it's gotta be. It's gotta be. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they're they're brought to the palace, and I don't know about you, but if I were to capture prisoners, I don't think the first thing I would do would be to take them to like a big gala in the main palace. <laughs> but they do. Um, you know, they're they're brought into the palace. We we have a, a quick little kind of throwaway scene with a lizard man, um, who Gold. is a he's a, a lizard man just easy as that who he's a lizard find, man <laughs> who we find uh in in the midst of trying to escape escape who what where why we don't know he's just kind of in the hallway he seems like he's already escaped well i thought they were like some subjugated race there and then later they're like teamed up with ming's guys so i don't know if it's just they're it's like star wars they're just another race that exists on this planet um and they're not necessarily for or against either side but they remind yeah. me of the was it the duke from the beginning of berserk the one that turns into the giant snake it's like this Very green similar. with like those bright red face and this bulging eyes and little tongue right because he's like a lizard but he also has like a man face but it's like in his mouth yeah kind of <laughs> yeah prosthetic makeup mask thing that they wore for the actor for the the lizard men was that hooked me it that that was like the <laughs> camp meets just like i couldn't like I don't know if they were being serious with it, like behind the scenes meta looking at it kind of thing. Like I, I had no idea where they were going with the special effects with this. If like this is the best we can do, or like let's make it campy. I don't know. I actually don't want to know because just seeing that face sold. <laughs> I like that's what got you. There's a there's a lot of moments in the movie where I'm just like, what the fuck? This is great. Oh, no escape, lizard man. Who then quickly gets vaporized by this weird floating orb thing. The so Flashdale and Zarkarva are brought into the main palace area, and we kind of get a little snapshot of all of the kind of alien species or races that are in Meng's uh, Meng's kingdom, and they're all like the whole thing is great because they're all, everyone's like wearing like bright, colorful like outfits. Um, we get a glimpse of Voltan and the Hawkmen, and <laughs> that's a band. <laughs> Voltan and the Hawkmen, uh, and a bunch of other like kind of throwaway aliens that we don't really see again so as they come into the palace we get this quick little weird thing which i had to watch i had to i watched it like a couple times we get like as ming comes out of like this giant this big giant door surrounded on both sides by like um giant statues of his head um all of his subjects give him this quick salute which is the most like nazi-esque salute ever Ooh, and i that. honestly i honestly well probably I the second couple... most nazi like salute ever after mm. the nazis <laughs> i guess that's true but like it even sounds like this they say the nazi salute thing and i was just like man it's real close well plus then even later um like when we get into zarkov's brainwashing and they're kind of jumping through his history and he thinks about the like world war ii and whatnot I think Ming even says, like, now there's somebody who, like, <laughs> was gone before their time or something like that. or was, like, on the yeah, right show, track. Yeah, he, he showed real promise. Oh, yeah, that's what it's like. Wow. So <laughs> they're really leaning into this. Yeah, I was like, this is a, a couple, like, in the, it's those two points that, like, it goes, like, dark and serious. Well, and I'm like, what? It's the quickest way for everybody to be like, oh, he's a bad villain. Like, compare him to one of the worst, if not the worst person of all time. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wonder if it had that kind of like, the, the comic had that kind of like Captain America phase, where it was like, the comic was going on during Nazi Germany. So there were, so like, maybe the comic made a lot of... Like parallels? Like, yeah, kind of like how Captain America and some other comics had. And so like, that was their way of 
of kind of still bringing that that kind of slightly i mean i don't know if it's called call it political but like bringing that beat in but it was just like this weird little like oh it's like what are we what are we trying to unpack here movie <laughs> <laughs> i think it's just shorthand for he's evil yeah that could be um so after the salute um we get the the tribute ceremony so the reason all of the alien species are gathered here is because everyone is to pay tribute um to the emperor and offer um different gifts now we don't really get that far into it we we see one of uh, one of the kings of uh, the planets doesn't have uh, a tribute to give because he claims that his pra- his planet was being subjugated and they don't have anything to give uh, except their undying loyalty, which turns out to be a weird assassination attempt that gets botched uh, and Ming quickly stabs him with his own sword. Uh, the only other tribute we see is from Voltan, uh, who has this giant crystal that looks a lot like uh, like plain flavored rock candy. <laughs> <laughs> that he offers up and i think he it's like some i think he said it's like an ice gem or something that he recovered from a planet phrygia um oh phrygia there we yeah. go and he holds it above his head and it's this giant thing and as he's walking towards ming we are blessed with the presence of prince baron aka timothy dalton uh who just swaggers his way down the stairs into the palace uh claiming that voltan had stolen the crystal from him and it is in fact his tribute uh now we we get a very quick introduction to the 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 relationship between between voltan and prince baron uh as they immediately draw their swords and go to kill each other um and we have this this interesting little thing with uh clytus uh who is the golden skull uh, golden skull masked uh commander of ming's secret police um who kind of you know, puts an end to this and that no one no one will die in Ming's presence unless Ming asks asks for it kind of thing. Um and we're really just getting like exposition of how bad Ming is and how like how terrible things are and how like oh the you know the the empire is like a military state kind of feel. We're we're really kind of just hammering that home in this in this whole sequence. Um so after the kind of uh little scuffle i guess you can call it is resolved ming finally takes notice of his new prisoners uh after flash rather inelegantly lets loose accidentally the 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 beautiful um line ming is a psycho which ends up getting (laughs) echoed throughout the entire chamber ming didn't love that (laughs) (laughs) ming did not exactly love um because he i guess flash just didn't realize that this little orb thing floating next to him was also functions as a microphone (laughs) <laughs> for like the entire palace area <laughs> so <laughs> it's just like offhanded like oh man this ming guy is a psycho and then you just hear it echoing through the hall um and ming finally takes notice after hearing that and our heroes rather awkwardly introduce themselves to ming which i love dale's uh dale's introduction where she's like oh i'm i'm, I'm dale arden you know live or let live that's my motto <laughs> Jill, um, master of lockpicks. <laughs> <laughs> same, same vibe. Um, so they all introduce themselves, and Ming is quite taken with Dale. He does not care for Zarkov, does not care for Flash, but with Dale, he's like, oh. like this feels very like I know this predates Big Trouble Little China, but it feels very low pan. Of it does this kind of like vaguely mystic evil force. Uh, but very like regal, but then also falling in love with the other, like in this case, Dale, or in the other case, um, Gracie. Yeah, it, it's it's a whole weird thing. And and we're not really sure what Ming's powers are, because Ming has powers, because after, you know, seeing Dale and being like, oh, man, like, I got the hots for Dale. He uses his magic ring to kind of make her do like, this weird little dance for him that like he finds erotic yeah but like ming's ring does exactly what every axe body spray commercial promised in the early 2000s (laughs) i see your shorts is as big as mine let's see how well you handle it yeah so she does like this weird little dance that's 
I mean, that's the way I describe it. I mean, <laughs> I think it was supposed to be like a very strippery dance, but it was just kind of just kind of moving around weird. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe the ring wasn't fully charged. <laughs> he left, He's it, like, oh, left it off the charger last night. He thought it was a wireless charger pad. It wasn't. <laughs> um. So after after the dance, uh, Ming orders that Dale is to be prepared for his pleasure. Um. It's very ominous. I don't know what what is going to happen from that, but things get kind of weird. Well, I like how somebody I forgot at some point in the scene, somebody um, says like somebody will die. I think they were talking about them. <laughs> and Cletus says like no one dies in the palace without a command from the emperor. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> when um, that's when Voltan and um, Prince Baron. Went, oh, uh, yes. Yeah. They yeah. Were fighting each other. Yeah. And then um, Voltan just kind of shrugs and he's like, hey, Ming. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell that like Voltan is like a a cool breeze away from being pushed to rebellion. <laughs> I love the exchange though, because after he says like Let's down your weapons, no one dies in the palace without a command from the Emperor. And they lower their weapons, and then Baron looks at um Voltan and they raise their weapons again because they just don't trust each other. <laughs> And just the look on his face every single time, man. Like he, I don't know who steals the scene more. I really don't. I'm just waiting know, for Ming I mean, to announce that it's a cash bar and Voltan rallies his guys. <laughs> that was the last <laughs> thing. <laughs> I mean, it's true. You you have like super suave Timothy Dalton, who like when he first came on the screen, I'm just like, oh, like holy crap! Like he just he has a presence. It's Bond. What? Yeah, he he has like that swagger and that like dashing to him. But then like Voltan's there, just like just this big boisterous like he, i mean he is a fantasy dwarf persona yeah or like the yeah. ghost of like, christmas present yeah like he's he just is he has like a big jolly like warrior kind of thing going on um and the two of them just just work so well together i don't know there's just something about it like i want that buddy cop film like i want them going off in the universe like solving crimes like it's very tango and cash Comparing mm. them to Legolas and Gimli is perfect. It truly is the best way to really put it. Yeah, I mean, even in terms of like costume designing, like it's a very similar feel. Um, yeah, I, th I think I think uh, Voltan is yeah, he's just that kind of uh, Tolkien esque dwarf character, um, and he ends up being probably my favorite thing about the movie. Like as we get further along while Ming is now trying to capture Dale for his pleasure, which is creepy to say <laughs> uh, flash goes into full combat mode and attempts to stop them. But Ming calls his bodyguards who it's great. It's just great. They're, they're dressed like football players, like the pads. This fight is madness. <laughs> it's, it's so good. Like Ming's bodyguards come in and they're all just dressed up like a football team, essentially. And they start brawling and Flash is losing because Flash, I mean, he's just a guy. And we kind of overhear that. Because <laughs> he's Ming's on the guards, Jets. Yeah, he's on the Jets. <laughs> he's nothing special. And we hear that Ming's guards are on like some sort of special like enhancement drug that makes them like super strong. Um, and so Flash gets taken down pretty quick until uh, Dale tosses him like a, a rock or like an egg. Yeah, kind of thing. it's like a Fabergé egg that just... <laughs> resembles a but football it, but it's like a medicine ball because he keeps throwing it at people's <laughs> faces and it just knocks them out yeah and it's just it's vaguely shaped like a football and then something in flash's brain just goes off breaks he's like, oh <laughs> this is this is a football match and he just goes full like full into playing like backyard football with his buddies he's like john Favre and, and the replacements yeah he just and immediately the whole brawl uh mood changes where flash is just killing it kind of because like i would say flash was winning this if this was a game of backyard football or like a game of kill the man with the ball <laughs> because he's just like he's running through them he's like throwing the ball at them like knocking them over but he's not really winning he's just kind of playing his own little football game yeah they're not like staying down but they're also yeah, not like, getting a hit on him so it's just this weird this weird little sequence and like it hits a, cres a crescendo when uh, Ming's guards get into like an actual line of scrimmage formation <laughs> <laughs> and Flash kind of like 
takes a couple steps back and he holds the ball in front of him and he actually starts like giving count like a count <laughs> like he's gonna run a play blue 42 <laughs> blue 42 what and like and he like dashes back and he like does a, i guess like a qb sneak and he like gets past them <laughs> and it's just like flash you're you're not winning but you're winning it's like Charlie Sheen winning, but not like the fight. <laughs> <laughs> like conceptually winning, but not in essence. Yeah. And like everyone's cheering and they're absolutely loving this. And Prince Voltan is occasionally getting free shots in uh, at the guards <laughs> that no one's apparently noticing. Which evidently all of uh, them understand football now. Yeah, it was. Um, it's a, it's a, I don't know. It's a great sequence. It's super weird and like kind of comes out of nowhere. It really and It's really unexpected um and like nothing else in the movie goes that far like the movie is like on terms of like like wacky like what is going on scale it's mainly like an eight this is a 10 and this is the only 10 um and so the the fight keeps going on until dr zarkov who's been feeding uh flash these football shaped rock eggs um accidentally throws it too hard and hits flash in the face and knocks him unconscious (laughs) (laughs) which great Zarkov just just great Flash is knocked unconscious the guards pick him up and start to take him away Uh, Ming declares that Flash is going to be put to death by poisonous gas immediately Uh, and this is kind of the area where we're introduced to Princess Aura which is Ming's daughter honestly Aura could have her own side movie because this could this movie is called Flash Gordon but it also could be called like the many loves of Princess Aura because I would watch it. I would watch it too. Because Aura's whole thing in this movie is that behind the scenes, she's basically running everything because she she essentially ha- has all of these affairs going on with all of these very high-powered officials that she can, at the drop of a hat, manipulate to do anything. And it even seems like she's manipulating her father to a point because while they're taking Flash away, she approaches Ming and asks to have Flash for herself. Because she's, you know, she's in the flash. She she digs him. She likes the Jets. <laughs> Ming denies her, um, saying that her her taste is too dangerous. Um, and Flash is taken away, and Zarkov is also taken away, um, to have his memory erased to end re- uh, reconditioned. Uh, apparently, what they want to turn Zarkov into one of their own agents. Uh, so Ming's daughter, Prince Aura. Uh, who has this whole side conspiracy thing going on uh, and has an, is having an affair with Ming's chief surgeon, uh, convinces the chief surgeon into helping her save Flash. So Flash is brought out to this big procession where the gas chamber is outside, weirdly, in this big dome where everyone's watching. And right before Flash is actually sentenced and they fill the chamber with gas, we see the chief surgeon inject Flash with something. And he says, oh, you know, this will help you on your way. And then he leaves. And we're like, okay, like, whatever. I don't know what that was about. But what, what actually happened is Prince Aura convinced the surgeon to inject him with an Im- immunity serum uh, so that the gas wouldn't actually kill him. He would just kind of appear dead so that hopefully, you know, Aurora, uh, Aura could save him later. She's playing 40 chess out here. <laughs> seriously like and oh, she's, yeah. she's just running running the show like she there's this whole thing like i mean it's like these throwaway lines that like tell us so much more about her that like she has her own palace on a separate planet that like her father supposedly doesn't know about where she takes all of her like suitors and has all of her affairs and like just just doing just doing her thing just doing prince aura stuff like and it's like she she has all of these suitors. She has all of this stuff, but it doesn't seem like she's like double crossing anyone. It's just, no, everybody seems to be aware. Everybody's fine with it. It's just, she's a fun character. Yeah. Like Prince, Prince Baron. Uh, and he's called Prince because he is engaged to marry her. Um, he, he knows like he's totally in on it. Like, Right before the execution scene, uh, Aura comes out and Baron's there and she's like, oh, Baron, you should you should go home right away after this. And he's like, why? And she's like, oh, well, I've, I've got a present for you. I'm going to I'm going to come to your planet right after this. And he's like, I don't trust you. <laughs> it's just like 
dude, you're engaged to her and you know that she's like this and she's just, she's running conspiracies. She's, she's like Game Game of Thronesing this whole place. I mean, it's either that Meanwhile, or the lizard man. He probably just knows. <laughs> <laughs> like she's, she's running Game of Thrones level conspiracies and everyone else is just like, yeah, all right. Um, all that was missing was for her to walk through like a garden unveiling her plans. <laughs> she needed that. She needed her her unveiling monologue. I um, love Flash in this like penance mask in the dungeon, though, because <laughs> it's just funny that like he's still talking even with the mask on. I know, and he's he's down there like right before the execution scene, just like yelling for the governor. Yeah. Cause he just, he doesn't really understand how this works, but he knows that like on earth, the governor can pardon you from a death <laughs> sentence. So he's just like, I want to speak to the governor. It's like, all right, fine. Of Mongo? No, of earth. <laughs> Bring in New York's governor in 1980. <laughs> so Flash is, is sentenced to death, but he doesn't die. And his body is taken away. Um, Princess Aura tells Prince Baron to meet her, uh, meet her on his home planet because she has a gift for him. I like how uh, quickly the henchmen create the tombstone for Flash after the execution. Oh, it's super nice. It's too. nice. <laughs> like, I mean, I know he got executed, but Ming's. I mean, he they're cares. artists. He's like, <laughs> he he's like, we want to spend money on these though. He's like, I'm going to execute these political prisoners but like make it look good <laughs> yeah so it's like this polished obsidian headstone and he's in like a legit tomb I, I i can't imagine the amount of money that is spent to in like home all of these corpses of all of these political prisoners that were executed he's like entombed next to ming's family <laughs> <laughs> i mean it looks nice you're my brother now flash kill him <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Princess Aura comes into this tomb, opens it up, and we see the the chief surgeon. And this is actually when we learn uh, that the the chief surgeon had given him the immunity serum uh, per Princess Aura's instruction. Uh, this is also when we learn that she's having an affair with him uh, and had whisked him away to her private palace on, on this other planet. Uh, and as per the agreement, we'll meet him there again. Um, so. She's she's running the show. Uh, so the chief surgeon uh, injects Flash with the, I guess, wake up version of the serum. I don't, I don't understand how the serum works, but injects him with this. And Princess Aura is a, like decides to Disney princess this awakening scene where <laughs> the surgeon gives Flash the injection, quickly exits. And then Princess Aura kisses him just as he's waking up. And Flash is like, what? How is this possible? And she's like, magic. I kissed you because I like you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, oh, it's just so good. I mean, she's so devious, but like, does it? For, I mean, she's not doing it for good reasons. She does, she's doing it because she wants to. And she's just like, I like you. So I'm going to weave these webs. I mean, she seems to pretty quickly put things in motion and help Flash like overcome Ming and get all that rolling so it seems like she was just waiting for some sort of help and it's not just like she's pro ming mm. yeah that's true it, it, she's not pro ming but like there's definitely a point in the story where she's like i'm no longer just like i want flash for my own amusement to oh hey like this could be thing maybe this could be something yeah i actually liked her and flash better than him and dale me too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that just... It made a lot more sense. Because, I mean, I get how, like, trauma bonding can happen. But their relationship seemed real weird later on when it felt like they've already been a thing for much longer than that. Yeah. Like, we'll have... I have notes later talking about, like, they have known each other for less than a day. They are engaged now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and like we don't know, like so Princess Aura and Flash uh, end up escaping. Um, they leave the tomb, and um, she gets Flash a pilot's outfit, uh, 
uh, to try and help him escape. And on the way, they pass Zarkov. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna backtrack a little bit, but I just wanted to talk about how they end up flying from uh, Ming's palace to uh, Prince Baron's planet. And we don't know how long that flight is, but like maybe maybe it was a few days, and they got some real quality time on that rocket to like really forge that relationship. Well, I thought that um, at the beginning, didn't Zarkov say there's like. X number of hours remaining, because isn't it like uh, later Dale even says like we only have fourteen hours or twelve hours left to save the world. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's so true. yeah, there's a big countdown. Yeah, so it's like okay, so they couldn't have spent that. Like he probably spent the same amount of time with Aura as he did with Dale throughout this movie. Hmm. But I guess he's just locked in on Dale. He just made eyes on her in that restaurant while he was on vacation. He was he was smitten. He, he was done. Made sure that her other pilot was killed. That way, the only way out of town was his private plane. <laughs> <laughs> his little four seater, you know. But yeah, so to backtrack, so uh, Flash and Princess Aura are escaping, and they pass by the, I guess, almost like the torture chamber where Doctor Zarkov is being held. And in a very James Bond situation, has this giant laser <laughs> pointed at him. Um, and Princess Aurea in, in Flash is reasonably extremely worried about the looks of this room. And Princess Aura just passes it off as like, oh, no, don't worry. They're just conditioning him to our planet's atmosphere. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, all right, you, you, all right, you play that 4D chess. I, I get it. <laughs> Uh, we actually learn that that chamber is where they are going to erase Dr. Zarkov's memory and replace it with basically conditioning programming to turn him into an agent of Ming. Uh, and so we get this this little scene where we're seeing basically Dr. Zarkov's life pass before his eyes, which uh, we're seeing all of his memories and like. It's his happy memories, his sad memories, memories of World War Two. Like it's kind of a cool way to get through a lot of exposition backstory without having to do a lot of explanation of like, we're going to wipe your mind of everything that makes you you as it zips 120 miles an hour through his entire life. Mm -hmm. And in like a couple yeah. seconds, it's like, okay, I don't know exactly everything, but I get a general idea of here's all the thoughts that go through Tarkov's head. And like, these are the things that are important to him. And it's, kind of an interesting way to get around like giving this guy a huge backstory mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and this is where we get tim you had mentioned the the little scene of like the world war ii and hitler thing um where they make mention it's like oh hitler he showed a lot of promise um where yeah it's it is cool because we get these scenes of zarkov with like his wife and his family and and then we get like this like several moments of like just world war ii like destruction and bombings and we're like oh okay so like this guy was like maybe a german scientist who fled like we're sure that was what i was thinking too especially with like the rocketry yeah and so many like actual german scientists from world war ii converted over we recruited them for our own rocket program leading to nasa well so actually i know later on in the movie um which we'll get to but briefly Tarkov mentions like I was able to like get around all of this by thinking of all the important things to me like my family a Beatles song the Talmud which that's a like a, a rabbinic text from Judaism so mm -hmm. I think it's not that he was a German scientist I think he was a Jew during World War well I mean he still is now but like during World War II I mean, he still could have been a German scientist. True, both could be but... true. I mean, until he yeah. was found out. True. Um, but yeah, so like we get this like glimpse of like, oh, Zarkov is like, you know, war torn, traumatic. Maybe that's why he was crazy. You know, like I could see. What it. if you find out these aren't thoughts on his mind because of the terrors of things? These were things he was doing over the years. And you're like, oh my god! Yeah, the things that made him happy. <laughs> it's like Zarkov is a monster. Zarkov was like the head of some <laughs> group in World War II. Ming is like, oh my god, put him down, put him down. 
<laughs> wipe his mind, then wipe mine. <laughs> um. So yeah, so Zarkov's memory is, is seemingly wiped, uh, and he is he is reconditioned. Um. Meanwhile, uh, Flash and Princess Aura are on their way to Arborea, which is the planet kingdom of Prince Baron. It's kind of like this weird swampy planet. Where the Ewoks live. Yeah, the Ewoks live. But it's not really a planet. It's kind of just like pieces of a planet. Well, everything seemed to just be kind of these like floating island continents. Yeah, it didn't seem it didn't seem like there were whole planets that existed anymore. Like even even Prince Voltan's kingdom was just like this flying sky city. Yeah, which I think it's called Sky City. (laughs) Is it really? Yeah, well, I mean, sure. hey, I could have wrote this movie. <laughs> uh, so en route to our Arborea, uh, Aura and Flash are uh, getting cozy. We we start to see the, the this other potential budding romance. She's about to show him the moons of Mongo. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like that. Um, and so like they're you know kind of making out, kind of showing Flash how to pilot the uh, the rocket. Which is foreshadowing. Is that to... what they're calling it? <laughs> <laughs> so flying the rocket, Flash is learning how to fly rockets, and like, okay, this is like another foreshadowing, kind of like how we had in the plane. I mean, it's it's I'm giving it a lot of credit that it probably doesn't deserve. But so we're we're getting these little glimpses, and then uh Aura rather reluctantly shows him how to use the telepathic communicator on the rocket. <laughs> uh and he uses this to contact Dale. Which, come on, man. Like, well, also, like, this whole scene was hilarious. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. This script is pretty funny when I least expect it. So, Flash is, on, is using the telepathic communicator to talk to Dale while he's making out with Princess Aura, which, like, dude, pick a lane. Like, <laughs> can, <laughs> just a... pick a lane. Yeah. Um, and he's, he uses it to let her know that he's still alive. But, He's um he's a little distracted while communicating with her. And I can't remember the line exactly. Yeah, he said something it was like along the lines of like, wow, she's attractive. <laughs> yeah, like something like yeah. that. And oh, she's really turning me on. Yeah, and Dale's like, what? He's like, oh no, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like what? Well, also, I like how da- he's like, Dale, you've gotta like get out of there, like you gotta like stay alive. And she's like, but how? And he's like fake them out girls know how they've done it to me <laughs> <laughs> that, that i lost it there that was so well, out of context for the rest of the movie and it was just like wow this is well, plus this is that weird. directly followed by the whole like what was that oh uh i wasn't thinking for you <laughs> uh g- gotta go uh hang up now flash uh so after after prince Aura shows him how to use the telepath communicator um uh, not af- after so yeah, so Flash tells Dale over the communicator that he's alive and convinces her to escape Ming's bedchamber, um, where finally she has been prepared for his pleasure, <laughs> um, which essentially means wearing a fancy dress, I guess. I don't know. Uh, so Dale ends up figuring out how to escape by switching places with one of Ming's slave girls, because um, he has like a whole boudoir of women that apparently he doesn't like. Um, Harem. Harem, thank you. And she ends up kind of figuring this out by using a potion that is procured from their pleasure planet. Everclear. Which, like, come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Zima. Zima. <laughs> um, which, which Dale is told will not make her forget, like, spending time with Ming, but will make her not mind it as much, which sounds so creepy. That sounds worse. It's real creepy. <laughs> Um, but so she has the, the, the slave girl take some of it, which kind of like puts her in like, like a stupor where she's just highly suggestible and switches outfits with her. Um, so she sends the, the slave girl to Ming's bedchamber, uh, and she puts on her dress and is able to escape, uh, on her way to escape. She is intercepted by Dr. Zarkov, who has now been turned into an agent of Ming, supposedly. Agents of Ming should have been a show. Oh, that would have been good. So Zarkov is there to intercept her, and he's very, he's very deadpan. He's just very monotone. Um, but, you know, Dale's like, okay, sure, whatever. Uh, so Zarkov is leading her out, and Clytus, the head of the secret police, uh, tells the guards to let them, let them go, because Zarkov is one of their agents. 
Although immediately after exiting the city on the rocket scooter bike treadmill, um, Zarkov tells Dale that he in fact was not brainwashed and he remembers everything. And he was able to prevent his brainwashing by reciting Shakespeare and the Beatles and just thinking about like humanity things because the strength of humanity <laughs> is greater than hashtag that. humanity things. <laughs> <laughs> it's humanity things is just filled with like pictures of football and apple pie and America. <laughs> America. America. <laughs> The entire thing, they were like, we're going to mind wipe them. And it's just like a f- waving American flag for 14 minutes. And they're like, oh, my God, Tarkov. And Tarkov's just lying there on the ground with like, somehow he's got an American flag hat. And he's just like, USA, USA. <laughs> he's like bleeding from the nose and eyes. <laughs> uh, so they're allowed to escape on the rocket scooter. Um, but moments, maybe faster than moments, uh, they are intercepted by Prince Voltan's Hawkman. And are, are taken prisoner by Prince Voltan. Now, while all of this is going on, we're, we're bouncing around a little bit. We're back to uh, Princess Aura and Flash. Uh, so they arrive at the, the forest moon planet of Arborea. Uh, and they get there just in time. Well, you know, lucky for them, I guess. Uh, to see a, a young man in, the, in their kind of society taking part in the planet's coming of age ritual. Which is the weirdest thing. And I can't... Im- I mean... <laughs> And yeah, they, I was they, just uh, waiting no for them to be like, fear is the mind killer. <laughs> it was just like, their population <laughs> must be like 12, because nobody's going to make it through this. So their whole ritual... kind of look like it. <laughs> it revolves around a big stump. <laughs> it's a big tree stump. It's got a lot of holes in it. And there's this weird, venomous slug creature that lives in the stump. And so uh, they get a bunch of guys together with sticks, and they basically bang the ground around the stump to try and agitate the creature as much as possible. It's like they're banging it, making it noise, and we see inside the stump this weird slug with a scorpion tail kind of hissing, basically. It's it's like a cat, too. It's like a cat slug scorpion. (laughs) It's my best description. And we see it kind of getting all riled up. And so what the guy has to do, he has to pick a hole in the tree stump and stick his arm in it. If he doesn't get stung, He's now a man. <laughs> Which is the best coming of age. It's just like playing Russian roulette. And uh, if you make it, then uh, you, get, uh, you get a cool sword. Yeah, you did it. If they get stung, then apparently over time, they'll just go mad. Um, so the Space madness. Space madness. The only thing is like, we even get camera angles from inside the stump seeing out. So like, you could just look in the stump, right? Like... <laughs> I don't think that would be the honorable thing to do. Like, I feel like you could just you could just take a quick peek and be like, no slug, go. And also, there's no there doesn't seem to be any rules as to how long you have to keep your arm in. So, like, I feel like you could just like you could just like dip in and just be like, yeet, and then out. <laughs> or you put it in with such force that if it is the one where the slug is in there, you just, <laughs> just pound it, it and then. <laughs> do you get more points if you grab this the slug by the tail and pull it out? That's how you become and take old, one big bite out of it. You're even an older man if you do that. <laughs> That's how you become chieftain. Prince Baron is just like, oh my god, oh my god! And just put, you just put your hand in. It. <laughs> it's like, why did you do that? So the young guy, he puts his arm in, uh, and unfortunately, he is stung, as we see by the little bit of Nickelodeon gack on his wrist. <laughs> it's like xenomorph blood, essentially. Uh, and so he immediately drops to his knees and asks Prince uh, Baron to kill him. Which he does just immediately. No second thought. Just dead. <laughs> what if Prince Baron like doesn't choose the quick way of a sword? He's like, please kill me. And he's like, okay. And he like grabs his head and it's like the Viper fight in Game of Thrones. God. <laughs> <laughs> so once the, once the ceremony is over, uh, Princess Aura and, uh, comes out around a tree. She was hiding because I, I don't know. I don't know why, actually. I know people aren't allowed in the temple, but like, can they not watch? Hmm. So she comes out and, and Prince Baron is overwhelmed because in his wildest dreams, he never thought that his fiance would, would be honest with her word, <laughs> which like, <laughs> dude, if this is your main concern, like, you got to know things are going on. Yeah, I like how he's like, prepare a feast. And she's like, no, 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 slow down. Yeah, she's like, it's like, my fiance has come to visit me. <laughs> It's like, ring the bells. 
Um, she yeah. is real. I told you all. My girlfriend from Canada. <laughs> my girlfriend from Canada is real. From space, Canada. <laughs> uh, so Baron is overwhelmed, super happy, and Princess Aura immediately cuts that shit off and is like, "No, Baron, I'm only here for a moment. I just have to give you your gift." And Baron is visibly hurt. He's just like, just all the happiness in his life is gone. And you then, find out that Prince Baron has like a humiliation kink and that's why he stays with her. Oh, maybe that's it. Maybe that's the whole thing. <laughs> embarrasses him at the party, embarrasses him in front of his own temple. He's been raging a hard on for the last like 15 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so Flash comes. I see your Schwartz is. Oh, never mind. So Flash comes out around the tree as the gift to Baron. And, and Baron, dude's just done. He's just done. <laughs> so Baron is super distrustful of this whole situation. But Princess Aura convinces him not to kill Flash. And Baron's like, fine, I don't, I don't know why. I don't know why Baron's fine with this, but he is. So instead, once Aura leaves, leaves, he decides to imprison him in like the most torturous prison chamber imaginable. It, he basically puts him in a, a giant cage that's half sunk in a swamp. It's, it's like do-it-yourself waterboarding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where, where it's just like i i almost imagine that like they're they have to like constantly tread water or drown because yeah. there's also a hawk man in that cage and he, it seems like he's been in there in a while and he's like on the verge of drowning the whole time i like how immediately supportive flash is that he's like you can do it man and he like already knows his name he's like come on we could do this <laughs> keep it up he's, he, yeah it was really like bonding with that guy which i don't know if he actually ends up being like a bigger hawkman character or i don't i'm not sure because like there's other there's some of the hawkman like are named characters and like have parts but like i don't know if we ever really see that guy again yeah flash throughout this movie gives me kind of like goku energy of Ooh, yeah super positive he's trying to help out everybody around him he even like tries to give his villain like enemies the benefit of the doubt and whatnot later like it's it really does feel like that and i think that's one of the reasons why i kind of grow to like flash throughout this movie rather than him being more of the like a joke oh yeah it's, he's like the golden retriever superhero yeah <laughs> he's like i don't know what's going on but i'm super into it and ready to go baron comes up with a way to kill flash because he doesn't want him there he hates flash he also probably hates the whole aurora uh, aura flash situation going on so prince baron sends one of his men to basically as a spy into the prison cage to try you... and trick flash into this is really convoluted to trick flash into escaping to get him to enter the like the temple area which he is not allowed and can only leave from if he participates in the ritual now this was great this was a real roundabout way like just just push him in or like just i mean this did kind of roundabout make sense of like i can't kill you but i am duty bound by our ritual if you escape you end up here and now i didn't kill you you took part in the ritual also i sent riffraff because it's if it is it is riffraff it from is. rocky horror picture show that he sends <laughs> like suddenly baron's playing 4d chess like <laughs> i just I, love how when he opens the cage he just opens the cage there's no lock there's no thing preventing them to just open the cage themselves to escape i think i think it's pretty much down there on their own free will i think it had like the level of complexity as like a dog kennel where it's just like you just flip it over and <laughs> yeah. pull it to the side. <laughs> yeah, it's like they're just down there, like just doing the honorable thing. Yeah, maybe it's really muddy and their like boots are stuck. <laughs> <laughs> You're trapped by minor inconvenience. <laughs> it's like, but if I pull my feet out, I'll lose my boots, and then they'll be all icky. <laughs> Riff Raff is like, we we can escape, and they're like, oh, we can't get out. And he's like, it's it's a pull door. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. oh i was i was pushing this whole time <laughs> he's like how do we get out i stole a key you stole a key to a cage made of twigs <laughs> <laughs> and he just holds the key in his fist and smashes the twigs <laughs> until they're out he's like there we go guys we did it <laughs> so yeah so they escape and flash is led into the temple chamber with the big stump where baron is waiting for him and tells him like oh oh you're in the temple now 
And by our customs, if you enter the temple as an outsider, you have to take part in the ritual. And so Flash is like, all right. <laughs> well, I, I like how Flash is like not taking the bait. It's all oh, you're going to do the ritual. He's like, nope, not me. You coward. Okay, let's do this. And he starts putting his hands in there. <laughs> That's the golden retriever energy. You just got to say it twice. That's like Marty McFly energy. <laughs> what are you, Yella? Do it, you coward. You're okay. It's like, you can't call me that. I'm the star quarterback of the New York Jets. <laughs> Prince Baron's a Giants fan. Hmm. I mean, he was wearing green. Oh, wait, no, oh, that's actually, Jets. we'd be a Jets fan. Yeah, that's true. They both are green. Giants are red and blue. Are they? Well, I don't know. I don't follow sports. We don't watch sports. <laughs> we, we watch movies like this. Sports adjacent. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's funny because in the comics, Flash was actually a polo player, but they didn't think people would. would polo make... wasn't popular enough <laughs> yeah. in 1980. They were like, no, prob this probably is not going to connect with people. Baron <laughs> convinces Flash to participate in the ritual. Uh, after I think he like just straight up just hits the stump with a stick like to get the the creature stirring again and Flash sticks his arm in and he's good nothing happens but so this is where things kind of go off the rails so then Baron in like a show of bravado probably because he's like intimidated because of the whole Flash and Princess Aura thing he sticks decides to, he, he decides to stick his arm <laughs> in too and then we have the scene of both of them just going back and forth, like sticking their arm into the thing, like trying to like dare each other, which makes me then think that like that first guy, he just got real unlucky. Like <laughs> it's like a combined like five arm jabs and nothing happens. And this guy was just like one. Nope. Dead. <laughs> uh, and so Flash seeing that like there's no like there's no way out of this. This is just going to get more and more heated until like finally he gets stung, uh, puts his arm in one last time and pretends to get stung. Uh, so he yells out in pain, falls to his knees, and he begs Baron to give him a quick death, kind of like how we saw when he first arrived on the planet. And th the ploy works. Um, Baron, you know, gets ready and, you know, very kind of solemn. It's like, all right, you know, I'll do this for you. And then Flash uses that as an opportunity to run away. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Which I, this kind of continues the whole thing of Flash isn't just some big dumb lunk. He actually is using his brains to get out of things. It's not just like, I'll fist fight my way through everything I come across. No, I took it as he was stupid and he just Mr. Magooing his way across <laughs> this whole movie. <laughs> Space Mr. Bean. I don't know. He, he, I think he generally has some good ideas. Yeah, no, he did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes his ideas are like real silly and like don't seem like they should work, but it's like, yeah, all right, you get away with it. I mean, this is one of those. But so he he manages to run away and he finds himself in just like the mud forests of this planet. <laughs> I forgot that he escapes and immediately falls in another thing. He like he like escapes, drops down, takes three steps and falls into quicksand or quick mud, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. And just immediately quicksand strikes again. Uh, and is then now fighting for life or death as he pulls himself out of the quicksand mud thing. And then immediately after he gets out, he is exhausted. He like rolls over onto his back like he is done. And this is where I'm expecting, OK, we're going to fade to black and go to a, a meanwhile. Right. Nope. Giant maw like opens up from the ground <laughs> beneath him and starts to try and swallow him. I'm like, it's like a baby Sarlacc. Yeah, it's like, Flash. <laughs> but it's just uh, a little too small for Flash's whole body. It's like Flash's plan. It's not panned out immediately. <laughs> So this thing starts to like chomp on him and like try and swallow him. And Prince Baron appears just in time and shoots the creature trying to, to eat Flash. Which, if you like backed out of the scene for a minute, we have Flash pretend to get killed or he was going to die, runs away, like probably takes a rope, drops from the platform, falls in quicksand, gets out, is getting eaten by the monster. And then Baron probably just, he probably saw this whole thing happen. <laughs> From the platform below. It is just like like face palm. Like, what? Like, this is my enemy? You would think he would be like Jackpot, though, because he wanted him dead, but didn't want to kill him himself, because it's like, oh, like I can't have Aura find out that I killed him. This is his perfect That or he's just really he's really nearsighted, so he saw Flash struggling. 
<laughs> and he raises up his crossbow gun thinking like i got him fires and doesn't realize that he missed killed the guy riffraff comes back just after he fires he's like sir i have your glasses oh <laughs> <laughs> he's like i don't look nearly as dashing with my glasses on that's why i don't wear them it's like trifocals. He just wanted he just really wanted the pleasure of killing him himself I mean, that could be. Baron seems like the kind of guy who would do that. Because he does fire, and then when the Sarlacc thing dies, he runs up, and then he's like, this is not, what did he say? This is one grave. Um, this is one grave you won't be returning from, and that's when he lifts the gun up one more time, but it gets shot out of his hand. Oh, that's right. Yeah, because immediately after he saves Flash, uh, Prince Voltan is just there with his Hawkmen. <laughs> I don't know why. Like, do they? I've been here the whole time. They just casually invade each other's kingdoms sometimes. Maybe they were friends at one point, and he still has a key. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't Voltan. They. Um. I don't know why they're on the ground floor when everyone else is like they're in Dagobah on the ground, and then up in the sky is like where Endor is. But um, it was like a scouting party sent by Voltan, oh, that's right. wanting a word that's right yeah so he's captured by yeah it's prince voltan's hawkman not prince voltan was not there himself mm -hmm. so yeah so they're captured by the hawkman uh, and the, this is finally when we get our meanwhile <laughs> so <laughs> we're back in mingo city uh and Clytus, the the head of uh ming's secret police uh informs ming that flash is still alive uh and through some vague suggestion uh, gains Ming's authority to discover the person responsible for, for Flash still being live by any means necessary. Now, when he suggests this, like, I feel like everyone knows who he's talking about. <laughs> it's like... It's Except like, Ming. I need to find the person responsible, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And Ming's like, yeah, sure, that sounds fine. Then it immediately cuts to the princess on a torture chamber being whipped. <laughs> it's just like, wow, that was fast. <laughs> My guess is he already had her. <laughs> <laughs> He's like roundabout asking for forgiveness instead of permission. <laughs> well, I like it's like everybody else in the room knows who he's talking about. And Ming's like, yes, whoever it is. And he's like, yes, but any means necessary, no matter what. And he's like eyeing around the room and everybody's just like trying not to laugh. And Ming's like, yeah, <laughs> I'll sign off on that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so then we, we, we cut to Princess Aura on the torture chamber being whipped and trying to get a confession out of her. Um, and it seems like the only evidence they have is that like they saw her leave the palace with a pilot and she came back without one. And they're like, this is it. This, this is the evidence. We <laughs> Which like they've already set Princess Aura up as they have to come to expect that she's going to leave the palace with a lot of different men and not necessarily come back with them. yeah like this is this is nothing new and actually they so they do talk about that briefly uh earlier when Clytus mentions to or no not Clytus, uh ming asks uh aura about like oh hey i heard or Clytus said that you went to this uh this planet with the, the surgeon and she's like oh no Clytus, he's just jealous and it's like, oh, yeah. so like you kind of know. So they're they're torturing Princess Aura and trying to get a confession out of her. And she's like, oh, no, wait till my father hears about this, blah, blah, blah. And then that's when like Ming, this. Ming's like, I think it's like a hologram, like a projection or something. Oh, that was him. No, I, I think that's him. Oh, is he actually He was there? just like walking yeah. through the hallway and just like is standing there in the doorway eating peanuts or something out of a chalice. Yeah. And he's like, no, I approve of this. This is good. Carry on. <laughs> Well, it's like she's tough and won't turn like all the the whip stuff. And then they're like, get out the boar worms. I have no idea what those are, but they sound horrific. Oh, yeah. I terrible. liked how they never even showed them either. It's like, oh, he's going to use them. And then later on, he used them on me. <laughs> I like not knowing. Yeah. And and I don't I can't remember. We don't actually see her confess. I don't think. I think it's just like implied that she does. Um, and so once, once she does confess, I think off screen, uh, Ming sentences her to be banished to the ice moon, the ice moon for Gia, um, just as soon as he finishes getting married to Dale, which I don't know if that's like a power move being like, Hey, here's your new mom. Get out of here. 
Or... <laughs> well, I like how he's like, give her a year in Phrygia to cool her like warm blood or something. It's like, so like, I guess he's a good dad. <laughs> the ultimate timeout. Yeah, he's just like, you, it's like, you, you've been conspiring against me and my empire. Why don't you, you just take a timeout, champ? Yeah, go sit and think about what you've done kind of thing. <laughs> exactly. Flash and Baron, who were captured on uh, the Swamp Planet, are taken to Sky City, which is uh, Prince Voltan's little kingdom, which is literally just like a levitating Sky City, which reminds you a lot of like in uh, World of Warcraft Shadowlands. Yes, I was thinking exactly <laughs> yep. that. It, it looks like, exactly like Bastion. The layout is exactly the same. It's a hundred percent. Um, so they're taken to Sky City, where Flash and Dale are briefly reunited. Literally, like, oh my god, it's Dale! Oh my god, it's Flash! They have not seen each other since they were first captured, <laughs> and they're briefly reunited. <laughs> Big hug. Everything's nice and happy for a second, and then Prince Voltan's immediately like, "No, this is that. That's not what this is. You need to fight to the death." <laughs> well, like, don't they meet up or something after not seeing each other? And Flash makes some comment of like, save it for our kids. <gasps> Do you mean, yeah, why not? And then they're like engaged and they met on the plane. Yeah. Well, I think that is the scene. Yeah. And it was just like, it was plane, crash, passed out in a rocket, taken prisoner, then engaged. Hey, trauma bonding. Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, but at least like. Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock and Speed spent more time together throughout instead of this where it's like oh yeah the movie it's the movie's been on for almost 90 minutes but they've spent 24 minutes of that together yeah I feel like I've spent more time with Flash than she has <laughs> <laughs> Princess Aura spent way more Flash uh, went, spent way more time with Flash than she had yeah I mean by that logic Prince Baron should be engaged to Flash I mean I could see that. It actually would be a power couple in Mongo. <laughs> Definitely would be. Um, so yeah, so Flash and uh Flash and Prince Baron are forced to fight to the death to the amusement of Prince Voltan, which I feel like Voltan wasn't even a hundred percent into someone dying. He was just like, I will I like Baron, I want you to go fight somebody because it'll be funny. But, like <laughs> that is that is the energy he brought to this. It, like it was to, to Voltan, it felt like this was a big prank. He was he was pulling on a friend. <laughs> like that, those were like the belly laughs we were getting. And I so, mean, if your prank is a tilt a whirl whip fight on the floor from Mortal Kombat, I mean, I think it's funny that I also like in my head wrote this down as a tilt a whirl of death. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this this is a great little like dual fight scene. Um, because they are they're literally on a a tilt a whirl covered in spikes that kind of periodically go up and down that is i would not want to fight on that no really that wouldn't. on all sides like has like a ring of that that's just open to the sky so it's like you're tilting back and forth if you fall off you you're going to fall thousands of feet to your death but also if you fall on the platform you're going to land on spikes and and the weapon of and there's a guy trying to kill you yeah and the weapon of <laughs> choice for this fight are whips <laughs> like the least lethal weapon in existence so this is like i i watched this fight and i'm just like i would just jump like i just i feel like this is one of those moments where like you're like playing a video game and you're just like nah i concede <laughs> like this is i not would think you would just like throw the whip at him and then when he goes to flinch just kick his knees <laughs> it's like this this whole this whole situation is not worth it <laughs> Just go for a ring out, yeah. Immediately, like, this is just this. You know, I'd feel, I feel more comfortable too if the spikes remained out. But Voltaire yeah. had like a remote control thing where the spikes would retract in, so the 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 whole tilt a whirl was just completely flat, and then the spikes would come out periodically. Then they would go back in. Like I, I would lose my shit mentally trying to make sure to avoid my opponent, and then having to deal with the tilt, and then also having to deal with like nope. That's going to be a spike in a second. Yeah, that's the thing. It's no just, way. it's just, it's too complex of a death trap to be able to figure out. <laughs> it's just, that's why I'm just like, nah, I'm good. I'm just going to jump. No, Mr. Gordon, I expect you to die. <laughs> I don't recall how fast the spikes were. For some reason, I remember it being slow spikes. Yeah, which they I don't. They it seems worse. 
Yeah, they weren't super fast, but like I feel like in universe, it was like a like a hydraulic press that like if you fell and they came up, you would definitely die. It just all of a sudden you fall and you're like, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> it just slowly goes all the way through them. And so, yeah, so they're fighting on this crazy platform. And so it was funny. So uh, Sam Jones was saying that this was one of the hardest things to film. He said, like, literally that this whole scene was a nightmare. Um, first of all, because the whole fight scene was actually incredibly dangerous and they were trying to avoid being injured. Because is it with real metal spikes? Well, because like I mean, they're actual things. I mean, they're, they're probably foam, but like with all of the tilting, like if you lose your balance, you're like gonna fall and tumble. And like if an actor even like twists an ankle or something, you're pushing back filming. So they're doing everything they can to film this scene, not get hurt, and apparently the paint on the actual moving platform, like the silver paint they used for it. Like was oh, it adhering super like, well, and it like yeah. kept constantly chipping as they were on it. So every time they had to do another take or like reshoot something, they also had to clean off, like clean themselves off because they would just be covered in silver paint. And there was just like, yeah. like this is this is almost as bad as actually fighting on this thing in universe. Well, also Mike Hodges told Timothy Dalton to actually kill Sam Jones during this. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they used real whips and actually hurt each other mgm is willing to recast you as james bond if you kill him (laughs) sam jones is like my agent said i go home after this it's like once they call rap it's just done right we just leave you (laughs) oh so they're fighting on the tilt the world it's it's rather dramatic it's a pretty extended fight scene it's very star trek it's like bum 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 david we can't use that we, we we're gonna have to cut that out oh uh, well just use the first three seconds right because that's i think that's where bum, the cut bum, off bum, and then yeah okay that works <laughs> um so eventually flash does manage to win uh as baron is hanging off the edge of the platform about to plummet to his death but rather than let him fall or kill him he offers his, his hand <laughs> and pulls him up um oh i thought you meant for marriage oh uh, i mean could be could be um <laughs> And it was the honorable thing to do. It's true. And Baron is over overwhelmed with his show of mercy. And he's like, what is this? And Flash is like, it's humanity. <laughs> he's just like, wow, you guys don't, you don't have like the concept of mercy. <laughs> and then Prince Baron swears him a Wookiee life debt. I mean, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> it's like immediately best friend mode. <laughs> On three, Flash, your favorite dinosaur, go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh yeah, so Flash and Baron best friends now, and they're like, all right, like we're gonna we're gonna team up, and we're gonna take down Ming, and it's like all of a sudden this is the turn of the movie where everyone's like, oh yeah, let's do a rebellion, where it's just like, oh man, all you have to do is be nice, like okay, <laughs> good, good to know this place is weird. Wasn't that wasn't that her plan the whole all along too was like slowly plant the seeds of rebellion? Oh, like Princess Aura? Yeah. I mean, definitely mm-hmm. could be. I thought she mentioned that like that that was her goal was to slowly unite all of the other. I mean, based on the way like things were going with her, I, I mean, I might have mo- missed that in my most recent watching, but like it makes a lot of sense, especially like bringing Flash as a gift to Baron. Like, what does that mean? She was going to slowly introduce all her suitors to each other. <laughs> A big love style. Yeah, I, I thought it was just a power move from her just to say, like, yeah, you know, I'm engaged to you, but I found this hot piece of meat and I just wanted to show you what you could be uh losing out on because we're not you put the you haven't officially put the ring on it yet. Uh, Princess Aura behind the scenes just <laughs> running everything. My dear, the ring is in one of these five stumps. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically just as Prince Baron and Flash have, have declared their undying friendship. Uh, Clytus arrives on the planet in his little shuttle and he gets to the planet and he, th- he threatens them with imprisonment because they're all traitors and they've been planning this whole thing and he's going to bring them in. Um, the only problem is uh, Clytus, Clytus, he's, he's all by himself. <laughs> uh, he hasn't seen 300 yet. He's, he's, he's got no guns. He's got no guards. And just a cool cool outfit just just cool outfit guy and just immediately eats it as flash and baron just like impale him <laughs> they, in a, they like one to this dude yeah just like just like they, it was like the equivalent of the when you shove someone and your friend is like on all fours <laughs> behind them 
<laughs> and just like just like one two him like directly onto the spikes of the platform in an oddly gory kill scene for this movie that his face just I, melts i really thought that they were gonna push him out like the moon well or whatever they they called it in game of thrones but just like that's basically what it is oh, it's yeah. just a big hole in the middle of the room that leads to nothing i really thought they were gonna push him down that not onto the spikes yeah and he just straight up impales and eyes popping out of his head and his tongue he just rots like a pumpkin out. it's just like what it, wow all right that was a turn like weird didn't know we were going this hard <laughs> um so now that clitus is dead prince voltan freaks out because he's like oh great now we're all gonna die because the emperor is gonna send his warship and kill us rightfully so <laughs> unless i can lure all of his soldiers one by one to that exact spot <laughs> <laughs> as Baron just keeps pushing them over flash <laughs> one at a time coming unarmed they have their guys with like these rakes or pitchforks to just like pull them off the spikes and clear it uh and so Volt, uh prince voltan orders the city to be evacuated and all of the hawkmen to grab everything they can and fly away um and then like seconds later ming's warship arrives it's just like all of a sudden everybody knows what's going on and is perfectly in line so we see the the hawkman fleeing and ming's ship comes out of hyperspace i assume because of the way it appears um in this beautiful matte painting in the background <laughs> i love the way they did all the like the kind of sky and space throughout mongo yeah of it's... it's all super trippy and but it doesn't it... look like that trippy like complete acid trip yeah where they just uh essentially i think they put dyes in water solutions and then just filmed it in different lightings so it's like this weird spacey like flowing <laughs> colors yeah like they're, they're really like well done like sky boxes and like some of the matte paintings that they use for backgrounds they're great like i have no nothing against them it, it gives the the whole movie like a real like strong like identifiable look to it Yep. Yeah. Like it would be like a cool 1970s Silver Surfer background. Oh, yeah. Oh, I remember those. Yeah. So Ming arrives on his ship uh, and he comes and you know, I for a second there, I really thought we were going to get another uh, tag team death here because Ming arrives on Sky City alone, just him and two guards. And I'm just like, we're, <laughs> all right, we're doing this again. Like, let's wrap it up. <laughs> Um, but you it, see Baron sneaking in behind him <laughs> in the back of the, the shot, just creeping ever so slowly, just kind of low to the ground <laughs> um, on all fours, slowly trying to get behind his legs. <laughs> so uh, Dale and Zarkov are taken aboard the ship, but Ming wants to have a conversation with Flash, uh, and makes him an offer. Uh, so Ming offers flash a lordship over the subjugated earth or whatever will be left of it after everything after like all of the the earthquakes and natural disasters just i don't understand ming's like motive here May, i mean he doesn't like at this point flash has no leverage um well i don't know if it was he actually intended to do this because like hey you've been a fair match here you go or if it was one last dig of I want to see this holier than thou guy break down and be like, yes, yeah, I'll take the the king, like, I'll become a ruler here if you let me live, mm. and then kill him anyway. Oh, that could be. I took it as um, Ming just has spies everywhere, and he's been aware of everything that's been going on. Because it also doesn't showcase what his powers are besides just using the ring. So for all we know, like, he is just, like, almost omnipotent. Mm, that could be. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, so he offers Flash this lordship, which, of course, Flash, with his uh, golden retriever energy, refuses outright. <laughs> uh, so Ming returns to his ship with Dr. Zarkov and Dale and orders that the Sky City is destroyed by his warship with Flash still on it. So we see this whole scene of the Hawkmen fleeing and the bombardment of Sky City. Flash just kind of stumbles into escaping because I guess they have like escape pods on the city that they didn't tell them about because he literally just like falls down a pit, <laughs> which I was just like, oh, we're going to get like Super a trash convenient. compactor thing. Uh, so he just falls down a pit and like finds what I thought was going to be like an escape pod, but ended up being a rocket cycle is I think what they call it in the movie. And so Flash gets on the rocket cycle and he 
I guess they don't see him because he manages to fly off and escape the destruction of Sky City. While he's escaping, we kind of go to a different area of the, of the planet where we see Prince Voltan and his hawk people. And Prince Voltan is really distraught because he's super remor- remorseful because he was like, oh, man, you know, I know I sentenced him to fight to the death, but I really like Flash. <laughs> <laughs> but death was in quotes. Yeah, death was in quotes. It was really just a prank. <laughs> Voltan's the new Mr. Beast. <laughs> <laughs> And he's like, last oh. one on the spikes gets ten thousand dollars. <laughs> and Voltan is like, oh, if I could have done it again, I probably would have helped him. And just at that moment, Flash is like contacts him over the radio, and he's like, hey, Voltan. And it's like he's talking to him like they're old buddies. And like I don't know, like something just happened. Like it's like Flash, he just has a way with people where they just like him. <laughs> and he contacts Voltan, and he's like, Voltan, we've gotta, we've gotta attack. Mingo City. And Voltan's just like, yeah, let's go. I was like, I know moments ago I was sentencing you to your death, but now I'm ready to die for whatever you want. <laughs> if I could do it all again, I would. Yeah. Because <laughs> that was a hoot. With that guy's face melted on the spikes. <laughs> like it was great. Who knew? Yeah, my city's destroyed. Half my people are probably dead. But it was great. <laughs> I don't blame you at all for everything. So they come up with a plan and Flash pretends basically baits an attack so he goes they they all go to mingo city and the hawkmen you know the whole hawkman army all seems like thousands of them are hiding in the clouds and flash comes out on his rocket cycle to try and draw out ming's war rocket uh the war rocket I actually hmm? i love this scene this was really well done uh so he's trying to draw out the war rocket called ajax and it's this this huge battleship and so you know flash is out there trying to draw it out and flash you know like flying around draws it out and he goes up into like these really dense clouds and so the commander of the ajax is like oh he's in the clouds we'll just shock the clouds and he'll fall out which i don't know how that works but like cool and so he's like shooting like lightning at the clouds and they're like flashing all different colors it's a really cool visual scene uh and once they're like satisfied that like all right he's probably he's probably dead like let's go get him the ship comes through the clouds. Up above the clouds is the entire Hawkman army, as well as Flash, just waiting for them. I believe uh, they are the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> Zing. And this is this is one of the best scenes in the movie, because we get the iconic uh, Hawkman dive line. The 14-letter <laughs> dive! <laughs> many eyes and many Vs. Who wants to live for? I don't know why they gave up the, like, I thought this was going to be like an ambush of, okay, they're going to come through the clouds and then we get them. But then I thought they would be closer to where they're coming out of the clouds. They come out of the clouds and they're waiting. And then it's like, no, they're still way far away. And then it's, okay, dive. And then the first unit starts flying all the way down to where they are. Yeah, I thought like when the rocket first came out of the clouds, they would just be right there instead it was like yeah the rocket fully comes out of the clouds and they're like still like half a mile away yeah i think that might have been the intention and just they couldn't portray it right mm, could be like behind the scenes because it i thought the same thing because honestly they would have gotten eviscerated or like you know just completely decimated because they were they lost like 15 people before they even got like 20 feet closer to the sh- yeah it was they were pretty outmatched yeah. Um, and- My question is, why didn't they just reuse the thing they used to shock the clouds and then just shock all of the Hawkmen that are in close proximity to each other? No, Tim, that gun wearing is, that, metal armor. That gun is just for clouds. <laughs> it's the cloud <laughs> gun. <laughs> what if it's not designed for it? It just it's like an honor system of we said we use it for clouds. <laughs> If they get near the cloud, we use it again. Ming will torture us if we don't use it for clouds only. (laughs) The ball worms. (laughs) So the Hawkman attack and they, their weapons are fine, but like they, they basically just have rifles against like a, a battleship essentially. And so their whole plan revolves around getting a mine placed on the ship to blow it open. And like the mock, the, the Hawkmen are dropping like Hawkmen, like <laughs> just losing people all over the place. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I'm, I'm pleased with myself on that one. And so, like, they finally, they get the mine on, but the, the, the named Hawkman who gets it on, he gets shot and gets knocked away. And it takes Flash to, like, go down with Prince Voltan onto the ship to be able to activate the mine and blow a hole up in it. And then they're finally able to get on board and uh, take control of the Ajax. This entire sequence felt very much like Captain America First Avenger, of, like, assaulting it and planting the explosives mm. and then, like, piloting this ship and all of that oh totally i mean it it like really had like a like a tone change a little bit where it was yeah. just like now we have like serious action like now we have stakes to things where before i think everything's kind of up in the air and kind of floaty yeah um so they get in the rocket and it's prince voltan and uh flash are are piloting it and i think there's there might be hawkman around but they're kind of just like doing their own thing and the plan is to crash the rocket into the city and it'll hit the electrical field that is surrounding the city that protects it and the rocket will blow up and blow a hole into the city and allow the hawkman to get in and assault the city so this is the plan uh unfortunately as they're getting closer and the rocket's getting shot flash realizes that they're not going to be able to bail out before the rocket gets there. So Flash decides, you know, I'm going to trade my life for millions and you need to get out of here, Voltan. It's like, I'm going to do this because this thing isn't going to make it. So Voltan reluctantly leaves and he's like, oh, good. You know, they have their little farewell thing for the hero sacrifice. Such a Cap moment. It really is a Captain America moment. <laughs> I mean, it's literally the end of Cap when it's like, oh, the thing's going to explode and it's, no, I got to fly it away from where people are so it explodes out in the middle of like the antarctic or whatever it is that's uh except in this case he's he, i have to stay behind and fly directly into where the people are <laughs> <laughs> that's where flash gordon 2 comes out he's like flash gordon domestic terrorist <laughs> <laughs> they like find him in an, an underground electrical field still alive preserved by the lightning <laughs> <laughs> ming has like a command phrase that activates him <laughs> So Flash is piloting the rocket. Meanwhile, Baron, who uh, Baron and Doctor uh, Zarkov, who are in the city, are going to try and deactivate the lightning field because they see the ship is coming and they know that they, the the field is up. And they're like, "Oh no, they're going to hit it and it'll blow up and Flash will die." So we've got to deactivate it. I like how both of them are like chained up initially, and they have it like written on the walls of like "Go Flash" or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's his name? Prince Baron just says like. Tell me more about this man, Houdini. <laughs> and then Aura, like, takes out two little, like, uh, hairpin daggers and kills a guard and then goes in to rescue both of them. Like, she's one of the MVPs of this movie. Oh, totally. Oh, I, yeah. I, I do also like that idea that, like, they're chained up in a dungeon talking <laughs> and Zarkov's just like, hey, there's this guy, Houdini, who he could escape <laughs> this in a minute. And it's just like, why, this, why are you telling me this? How well, they're both helpful. so nonchalant of just like, yeah, we're probably going to die at this point. We're chained up. Just let's have a conversation. I'm kind of interested in what we're chatting about now. <laughs> just love this reaction to it. Like, Tell me more about this Houdini. <laughs> <laughs> but then it's true. Yeah, Princess Aura comes in with her little like hidden daggers and kills the guard. And like she the fact that she has these means that like she is like doing super spy stuff. Yeah, that like there is there's probably so much more that she's doing that's just implied by the fact that she has these hidden daggers like in her clothing i i would love a spinoff thing with more of like her doing all the espionage things and all the behind the scenes stuff going on agents of ming <laughs> well it's so funny it's like i was getting like at this point in the movie i was getting real vibes of um uh trying to think of the character's name from resident evil who was the spy leon kennedy Ada Wong. Ada Wong. Oh, oh, Ada Wong. Yes, thank you. I was getting real Ada Wong vibes. That like, what is going on here? <laughs> like, it's like, who do you work for? <laughs> Baron, Doctor Doctor Zarkov, are managed to escape with Princess Aura's help. Uh, and Baron gets out and uh, gets to like this big like control room with these weird ass like droid characters. And like, this is like another like weird like it wasn't gore, but it was like a shock violence where thing. they pull off like the. It looked like they were just wearing glasses of these like workers and they pull it off yeah. and there's like you pull it off and they give you like this music sting 
and it's their eyes are just like wired like they don't have eyes anymore they're just like wired into the machines yeah that was surprising but i love how they they pull it for one and then like as if they're all a part of a daisy chain and they remove the first like powered one because once they remove the one guys all the rest of them ended up doing the same thing <laughs> it's, it's like a string of christmas lights yeah <laughs> you have to replace the glasses on the one guy and all of them come back Throughout this whole movie, I swear, every time I think I know what's going on, they pull the rug out from under you. It's just, yeah, yeah. there's just another another thing happening. It's just, there there are so many story beats and so, like, like, I don't know. There's, like, so much to unpack and everything. Oh, no, I mean, it's just like, oh, like, he, the eye thing when, like, um, Clytus gets killed. Like, I'm not expecting the way that those specific people end up dying. Mm. And even when they kill... <laughs> um, Who's that lead, like, commander woman? Oh, uh, Clara? Uh, Kala. General, yeah. Yeah, when they end up killing her, the way that she just deflates and it's just like black fluid just comes pouring out of her. Which is a cool detail too, right? Because they're all, like, supposed to be different alien species. So, like, the fact that, like, the blood's a different color or, like, just things that happen when they get killed. It's like, oh, yeah, like, they're aliens. So, like, I guess maybe that could have, make sense. Yeah, I appreciate it. I do like it. And that's what I mean. It's like, that's so much the story beats, but, like, that's where the rug gets pulled from under you. Mm. It's like, I was not expecting some of the characters to die the way that they did. Uh, and so it's actually this scene where uh, Baron manages to kill Kala. And then he goes on to sabotage the lightning field generators so that uh, <laughs> Flash... <laughs> well, I like how... To take out the lightning generator, Prince Baron just spawn camps all the guards in that. <laughs> he shoots one guy and then just like hides behind the wall. And then another guy comes to look at the first guy and he shoots him. Then another guy comes to look at the first two guys and he shoots him. And it's like five guys he goes through. I just remember like he's like running down the hall and he shoots a guy who was like setting up like an automatic gun. Like it looked like it was going to be yeah. like a gun turret. And he shoots one of the guys and the other guy flees. And in like my head, I'm thinking like Baron's just like score. Now I've got a better gun. <laughs> it's like, why did you leave that for him? You think it's a gun, and then you find out it's just he was setting up folding chairs for the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like Baron, Baron is just like having his Rambo moment, like running down the halls, like just like mowing guys down, and he deactivates the lightning field generators. So Flash's suicide mission turns into a slightly less likely suicide mission. Because he's still crashing into the, like, into the palace. So the lightning field comes down, and everyone from the wedding party can see Ajax, this giant warship heading straight for them. So in the middle of, like, the whole wedding proceedings, uh, everyone starts to flee. Which, I love the wedding proceedings of these vows of, (laughs) I vow not to blast you into space no matter how wary I grow of you. And then the, like, sky banner of all creatures will make merry under penalty of death. <laughs> yeah. Put that on a Pinterest board. <laughs> there's just, like, the in the vows, there's, like, this permanence of things I won't do. And then it's, like, quickly, like, asterisked, like, until the appropriate time ha- comes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, like, all the wedding guests start to flee because, like, they see the ship coming. And <laughs> Dale takes this moment of, like, <laughs> like, everyone's playing. The ship's coming. Everyone's going to die. And she's, like yeah flash she's just like standing out in the open before she finally <laughs> she's decides. engulfed in flames <laughs> she finally decides to leave and so like everyone's running except ming who just stands there defiantly and as like the ajax like comes plowing into uh the palace the like nose cone spike of the ship <laughs> just perfectly just... impales him He's not good at flying, but he's really good at crash landing. Crash he's landing really good at impaling villains on spikes because he's two for two in this film. <laughs> All of his deaths were spike related. Um, and so, so Ming, who's now impaled on the spike, I thought that was going to be it. But apparently he was fine because Ming just pulls himself like pulls like a Dante from Devil May Cry 1. Pulls himself <laughs> off the spike. Uh, and starts and uh, basically attacks Flash. Flash, who has a sword at this point, attacks Ming. But Ming uses his ring to like freeze him in place, which we we saw earlier um, when he killed one of the like princes of one of the other kingdoms. Uh, but because Ming is wounded, it's not working so well. Either that, or it's really low on battery. <laughs> he like still <laughs> hasn't charged it. it. <laughs> 
I would have loved instead of facing off against Flash, he pulls himself off the spike and then just goes into a dead sprint out the door. <laughs> just gives you up. Just, you hear his feet going all the way down the hall as he just like runs off into the distance. Um. So yeah, so Ming, seeing that he's losing and that his power is, is starting to like fade because he can't control Flash anymore, he aims the ring at himself and just i don't know he he just vaporizes himself it seems like well he looks like genuinely distressed in this scene before getting sucked into his own ring and i just love that max von Cito at no point acted like he this was a below him kind of thing of oh i'm just gonna get a paycheck it's like he was doing ming well oh totally all the actors didn't phone it in they all put 200 percent into each role and it shows yeah yeah i mean absolutely and yeah i mean i think he played ming really well i mean ming's a weird ass character but like i never once questioned like the acting of any of it it was great and yeah. super genuine so yeah so ming kind of just vaporizes himself and kind of like um i don't i mean we're supposed to think that like something has happened i don't really know exactly if it's like a lord of the rings ring of power situation or if he just gave up and was like, nah, bro, I'll do it myself. <laughs> no, I have Nobody it. kills Ming but Ming. <laughs> it's like no one dies in Ming's palace without Ming's command. <laughs> <clears throat> no, I, I have a theory, but I'll bring it up later. Okay. Kill me, Flash. I command it. Now I don't, now I kind of don't want it. <laughs> what is the uh, the line from Bioshock? Um, would oh, would you know? kindly? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. The, like, uh, it's like a man does, a slave obeys. Oh. <laughs> um so so after after ming disappears into his ring maybe there's a huge victory celebration shoot ensues with with and i put a, an asterisk on this of like with planet earth being saved maybe because yeah, nobody verifies i thought because when Cra when flash crashes into the palace he has like this clock that he estimated how much time earth had left and like when he crashed it was like four minutes and well, now with the way that the earth would have been destroyed it's just the moon colliding with it and i guess like the orbit decaying mm -hmm. realistically if that happened the moon would have become like shattered into millions and millions of pieces once it got close enough to the earth like yeah. that's, that's how rings form yeah the, the the clock countdown that zarkov made should have been more like a this isn't when the earth will be destroyed it should have been like this is when there's no coming back for the earth <laughs> yeah so also though didn't zarkov originally do his time estimate at the beginning of the movie when they were still on earth or did he recalculate it later that's unclear because if he did it when they were on earth once they're in space traveling at a different speed and all of this wouldn't time work differently out there i mean they pass through a wormhole there's no telling how much time has actually passed <laughs> we did it they get back and they found out earth's been destroyed for twenty thousand years <laughs> it's probably like an interstellar thing you know, i was gonna say it's like interstellar taught me anything it's a time works different in different places <laughs> yeah. yeah uh so with earth saved maybe um baron prince baron is proclaimed the new ruler of mongo uh Aura finally decides that she will in fact marry Baron, and Prince Voltan is named the general of all of Mongo's army, and which is super fitting. Yeah, he just looks thrilled to be there. Oh yeah, he's he's happy. <laughs> They're buddies now. Everything's great. Baron's actually going to get married, with, with probably a lot of asterisks and prenups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's this this funny little scene where um i think baron asks flash like oh hey like are you gonna stay in mongo like there's always a place here for you and flash is like oh i don't know and dale says i'm a new york city girl at heart and i'm just like i don't think you guys are ever gonna make it back also like <laughs> i feel like your lives are here now <laughs> they both laugh and voltan's like i don't know what new york city is <laughs> I, I feel like there's like there's this genre of like fantasy sci-fi movie where like the heroes have this grand adventure and then at the end they're like okay let's go back home and it's like no your life is here now this is the most significant thing to have ever happened to you 
You're staying. Hey, what are you going to do? Go back to the Jets? <laughs> this? Both, no, she's not. She's not going to come back for the sequel. They're going to break up off camera between movies. They'll probably do that thing where like they broke up and now they're trying to get back together. Mm. I always like the uh, the John Connor of Mars treatment. Or like, I mean, technically the book series was the Princess of Mars. Where like at the end of the first book, you know, after he's like, re, you know, helped retake the kingdom and he's won the war. And he's like, cool, I'm going to get married to you and I'm going to stay here. And this is where I live my life. And it's like, yes, finally, someone who gets it. I mean, he inevitably is transported back against his will. But like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, why would you leave? This is the most important yeah. thing that's ever happened to you. You can be king. Boy, who's going to cover my shift at Starbucks? Yeah. <laughs> or or like the, um, the line, the witch in the wardrobe where they accidentally go back. And it's like, you have lived an entire life and now you're yeah. children again. So they, it, it's, it's kind of implied that they'd go back if they could, but they can't really. So like, they're going to be, they're going to be in Mongo, on Mongo for a while. So after that little celebration scene, we kind of get a little question mark at the end as we go back to the, the like throne room area where the wedding was. And we see ring, uh, Ming's ring. I was going to call it the ring of power. That's good. Uh, <laughs> just sitting on the ground and then like a black gloved hand picks it up and we get a, the end uh, fade screen with Ming's evil laughter in the background. So, Which I guess supposedly that was supposed to be Clyde, uh, Clytus, Clytus's hand to bring him oh. back for a sequel as like the new villain, but his face literally rotted. <laughs> and we, we saw him die pretty hard. That wasn't like an off screen. Well, he died in the Sky City before the Sky City blew up on him. Because my theory would have just been like, I figured he teleported to like a back to tank or something, healed himself, and then just went back and grabbed his ring. It's actually Princess Aura. She finally has all of the stuff in motion. <laughs> she needed to collect the last ring. She's like the uh, the Mandarin. <laughs> she now has all the rings of power i would have a thousand percent watched a sequel to this oh totally i mean there's enough material like you've got decades of comics to fall back on oh yeah i want a sequel to this though i don't want a remake i want them to go back do the shitty special effects everything but modernize it <laughs> Same lovingly camp, crafted same actors too i don't care if they're pushing 80 90 years old at this point bring him back yeah that uh interview i saw with sam jones he's uh he's he's look he's he's pretty old he's pretty up there i mean max von Sydow was born in i think 1926 so he's 97 now i think this year <laughs> it's funny with um brian blast when i saw that behind the scenes with him doing the voice work for a total war warhammer like he looks the same basically <laughs> <laughs> He has not changed much. Timothy Dalton's still barren. <laughs> it's just who he is. Yeah. So thank you for having me watch this, David. I, I I'm, thoroughly enjoyed this. I'm, Excellent choice. I'm glad you watched it. This is this movie holds a very strange but very special place in my heart. Um, as the as like one of the the movies I saw in my my formative years of discovering that I loved fantasy sci-fi, and it was funny. Like I I. After the first time I saw it, I hadn't watched it in a long time. And in my head, I kept confusing it with the He-Man movie because I see that. And it was mainly just because of um oh what what is his name? The uh oh Clytus. Clytus and Skeletor look so similar in those movies. Because like the the costume and like the skull mask, like in my head looks so similar that I would like think about it and I would be like wait, was that He-Man that I saw? I mean, outside of like the gold, like they looked so similar in it. I was just, I, I used to always get confused about which movie was which. And before the internet trolls like try to lunge at us for confusing Skeletor with somebody else, like we know what Skeletor looks like, but when you think back to like early childhood and you think of these two movies as like fever dreams, that line gets blended real well. Like shit, which one is it? Because when you combine this with Krull, he-Man, Master of the Universe, Conan, like Beastmaster. It they all kinda you could almost cut them all together and mm -hmm. you wouldn't know the difference between each one. Yeah, like campus campy fantasy movie with a blonde haired buff guy. I mean, yeah, right. <laughs> That's a genre. <laughs> Not to mention, like in some scenes, Flash almost looks like um 
what the fuck's his name? He-Man. Uh, oh, Dolph Lundgren. Yeah. Like in just the way that he looks like in the cartoon anyway, you could you could easily blend the line. Thanks again for coming along for the adventure known as Flash Gordon. As always, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at Screen Refresh, or email us your own movie memories at screenrefresh at gmail.com. If you like the show, help us out and leave a rating review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcast to help others find us. Please leave a rating and a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast from to help others find us. You can find David over on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Find him at the.screaming.brain on Instagram and the screaming brain, one word, on Facebook and TikTok. David, do you want to tell us anything that you've uh, got going on or anything like that? Yeah. So um, if you if you do happen to come onto any of my social accounts or follow me, The Screaming Brain is a uh, a small board game publishing company specializing in cooperative board and card games. That essentially our goal is to create puzzles and challenges for you and your friends to make your brain scream. So if you enjoy difficult, uh, challenging, difficult, puzzly uh, cooperative board games, then come check us out. Uh, and maybe give one of our games a shot. Do you have any games that are already lined up? Um, well, so our our game, The Exorcism at the House of Moncton Falls, is is out and available in a number of uh, you know physical retailers as well as uh, on Amazon uh, and Board Game Geek. Um, and we have a, a couple other card games that are currently in the works. We have a, a card game called Exo that we've been um, putting some content on. Um, that you can check out. There's a bunch of videos on that on TikTok as well. And we uh, have a bunch of other stuff in the works that we're really excited to start talking about. So awesome. Can't wait to hear more about it. So for David and Tim, I'm Nick, and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks for Rule of Thirds. Dive.